I am experiencing audio coming in, but uh, I'm able to see all of you beautifully. Um, good morning, all. Uh, thank you, Nicole, for uh, joining us. Uh, um, you know, uh, we are in the second edition of our um, of our um, um, space philosophy program. Uh, in the in the first edition, uh, we um, we we got this impression that um, uh, philosophy is at the core of everything we do, and uh, um, what we do uh, depends on how um, we approach the problem, and that is why um, uh, philosophy is important, and it, it it is even more important in space. Um, in the space uh, work that we do, because there is so much unknown um, uh, in this new endeavor that's only only 60 or 70 years old. So with that, I want to introduce to you um, Nicole, um, uh, who uh, has been in many different things, um, uh, astronaut, first of all. Uh, she has seen uh, planet Earth from above and uh, uh, now uh, she's engaged in what I would call a philosophical endeavor, uh, which is the arts, you know, and uh, she has a recent book out. And without further ado, Nicole. Thank you, Madhu. And I am um, honored to be here with you all today for this space philosophy gathering. I'm going to um, share my screen and see if I can make that work. It's always the hardest part for me. Um, okay, there. I think it, I think it's up, and I'll just let you know. I um, I really I'm really happy to be here for the opening remarks for this event. Uh, I'm going to start with a a little video trailer that my publisher put together for the book that I just released. I don't mean this in any way as a shameless plug for the book. However, I do hope that you all will read it. But I think that um, it's just a quick way to introduce you to the feelings I have after having the opportunity to experience our planet from space and bring that experience back to Earth. So we'll start with it. It's only a couple minutes. Let's see if I can make that happen too. And hopefully you all will be able to hear it. As well. I've been blessed to experience our planetary home from some extraordinary vantage points. From inner space on the Aquarius undersea habitat to outer space on the International Space Station. Witnessing the complexity of human survival in these extreme environments I discovered three unifying and life-changing lessons. We live on a planet, an overwhelmingly beautiful, glowing, colorful, crystal clear planet. We are all earthlings and the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets and protects us all. We build our spaceships as mechanical life support systems like the ISS to mimic as best we can what Earth does for us naturally. As a crew on the space station, we know that our survival depends on staying acutely aware of the health and well being of our atmosphere, of our spaceship, and of all our crewmates. In contrast, here on Spaceship Earth, we pollute our atmosphere, our oceans, and our soils. We are experiencing devastating impacts to our planetary life support system and to all life we share our planet with. To survive and thrive, we must bring these three simple lessons of planet, earthling, and thin blue line into our daily lives. I came back to Earth knowing that by behaving like crewmates, not passengers, we have the power to create a future for all life on Earth that's as beautiful as it looks from space. Okay. All right, so in all of the complexity of spaceflight, uh, as I mentioned in the video, I came back to Earth with these three simple and very positively impacted, I will say, um, by these three simple yet powerful lessons, you know, that they're, they're obvious, we know them, we live on a planet, we're all Earthlings, only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere. And as Manu mentioned, this is the second of, of these space gatherings. And I hope that the space philosophy gatherings, I hope that everyone either participated in or had a chance to watch the video compilation from the last one. And because another reason I, I wanted to share 
this video is that I think it's directly supportive of this forum and the common things themes that are being leveraged from the last meeting and as a lead into today's. And one of the things that came out of the of that session was that our species and our biosphere are inextricably I can't even talk today inextricably linked. Now, that's a theme that will run through all of this. Um, the majority of my time in space was spent aboard this masterpiece, the International Space Station or the ISS. Um, the ISS program motto is off the earth for the earth. I think there's a lot of philosophy in that as well. A place where we are working as an international community together for the planet. Everything done there is ultimately about improving life on earth. I could speak all day about the significance represented in this one picture. You know, best example of living off the grid, you can find world-class laboratories and science going on here. For the past 20 years, um, actually more than 20 years now, we've had crews made up of members from 15 different countries living and working peacefully and successfully together here in space. And on the ground, tens of thousands of people working peacefully and successfully together to support the crew of the station and the hardware. Now, as I mentioned in the video, we build our spacecraft like the ISS as mechanical life support systems because to live and work there in space is all about the people, at least for human spaceflight. We necessarily have to build them to mimic as best we can what Earth does for us naturally, where every day is a crew just in order to survive. We know we have to be acutely aware of how much CO2 is in our atmosphere, of how much clean drinking water we have, of the integrity of our thin metal hull, and absolutely of the health and well-being of all of our crewmates. Now, this is a picture of the folks that I spent my three months with during my space flight. I love it because I think it represents to me the mix of personality and professionalism that we find in our best teams, you know, in the kind of people that are the best to work with on anything. And you should enjoy your time in space. And we did. But I also knew that when the emergency alarm went off at three o'clock in the morning, you know, yeah. telling us that all the air might be spewing out of our spaceship and into the deadly vacuum of space, I knew that every one of these people would have my back. And I know that they trusted I would have theirs. And I think the same is true here on Earth. We should absolutely enjoy our lives shared with each other and all other life on Earth. And we should also know that we'll have each other's back when our life support system is threatened. Now, we work together as one international crew on the ISS because we understand the value of looking at things from new and different perspectives. We can take gravity out of the equation, which allows us to look at pretty much anything from a scientific perspective in a whole new way. But it also, I think, opens us up to new perspectives, to the ways we can live and work better together just in general. Now, during our free time in space, it's pretty much guaranteed that this is where you'll find us, um, floating in front of a window, doing a little Earth observation. Uh, as a crew, we are always looking at the environment inside and outside our space station from a new perspective. The three lessons of planet, Earthlings, and thin blue line become our new reality. Uh, I think there's no doubt uh, that we are all overwhelmed by the awe and wonder of our home planet that we experience from this very special vantage point. And we're overwhelmed in some pretty extreme ways. At the same time, you know, we are both comforted and I think frightened by the stunning view of our home against this seemingly endless blackness of space. These are not just though observations that we make while we're in space. But when we come back to Earth, it's something that drives a call to action for us, for our planet, and for all life that we share it with. Now, I, whenever we go somewhere, I would argue that it's just human nature for us to look for something familiar. And that's no different when you're on a spaceship. Uh, when I first got to space, I wanted to see Florida from space through the window because I considered Florida to be my home. All right, I clicked. Let's see if it does it. Oh, there we go. And every time I looked out the window, I was surprised by something new, something awesome and wonderful. I couldn't deny the interconnectivity of everything I saw below me. Lightning storms in particular were something that reminded me of this. 
Um, there was no, it was like watching a display of light in motion that appeared like neurons firing in a brain, like the planet was always presenting itself as alive and in motion and as one whole place, you know, that everything is interconnected, everything's interdependent, and everything associated with our survival depends on understanding this and acknowledging the fragility of our planetary life support system. But very quickly though, while I still looked at Florida uh, out the window, and you can see it in this picture kind of coming in from the white side of the screen, Florida became a special place on a planet that's my home. And with this view, I think there's no denying that a planet is our home. Now, my very favorite picture from space is this super zoomed in image of a tiny chain of islands off the northern coast of Venezuela called Las Rocas. To me, it looks like somebody had reached down with a big paintbrush from space and painted a wave on the ocean. And this one image was an inspiration for me in space, and it has continued to be an inspiration for me while back on Earth. And I had the chance to paint while I was in space, and the wave is what I painted. Uh, and this really was, it was a personal highlight for me from my space flight. And I believe it's an, a really great example of putting the human and human, in sp human space flight. We can't forget to respect the things that make us human, whether here on our planet or as we venture further from it. By acknowledging our humanity, it also leads us to pursue meaningful things in our own lives as a result. And for me, that's included using my artwork to share the spaceflight experience. But I think more importantly, it's helped me find my next mission in life um, through the work of an organization called the Space for Art Foundation. You can see some of our work here, um, but I'm gonna share a little video with you that shows a little bit about that project because I think um, my own call to action has come through this intersection of space and art and healing. And the Space for Art Foundation is uniting a planetary community of children through the awe and wonder of space exploration and the healing power of art. And in this video, you can see we work with kids all over the world in hospitals and refugee centers. And then we bring each of their individual pieces of artwork together into these creative art spacesuits or other projects. Um, our friends at ILC Dover, the spacesuit company uh, who made the suit I walked with in space, uh, quilt those suits together for us. Um, some of them have had the opportunity to fly to space. We've had the kids come together in mission control and piped into the hospitals and centers around the world so they could see this, see where their piece of art has come together. And I think it's just a really wonderful way for them to transcend that experience of what they're going through in those places and talk about, consider, and think about their own future. And um, for me, it really is another way to leverage this um, spaceflight experience in an off the earth, for the earth uh, way. Now, while I highly recommend flying in space, and I hope anyone who wants to will have the opportunity, one thing I think is really important is that you don't need to leave Earth to understand this unifying perspective. And I, I'm fairly certain that everyone on this uh, forum today understands this. You know, this understanding can come from just opening yourself up to the awe and wonder that surrounds you every day in your own backyard. And that surrounds us every day in our universal backyard, like we see in this picture from a Cassini, the Cassini mission. We can and should always be looking for our relationship to what surrounds us. And I'll close now. I know I've been rambling on. I've been trying to do it in the amount of time I have, <laughs> so speaking fast. But I'm, I want to close with this iconic Apollo 8 Earthrise image. You know, even without traveling to the moon ourselves, I think this is still the best way for us all to understand the who and where we all are together in space, the interconnectivity of everything. And some words that Madhu shared with us all in the invitation for today about the last gathering, and I'm going to read them, I've got them here, is a common theme that resonated throughout the day-long event was that our species and our biosphere and our view and place in the cosmos are inextricably linked. The messages conveyed suggest that we act collectively in a manner that responds to nature benevolently starting from caring for our immediate earthly nature and environment. And space activity, human space activity in particular, is helping us to make better stewards of spaceship Earth, 
or more appropriately, Mother Earth. And to that, I say amen. Um, ultimately, I think that any philosophy, space philosophy included, is about seeking understanding of fundamental truths about ourselves and the world in which we live and our relationship to the world and the life we share it with, and to understand how we can not only survive, but thrive. And for me, the three simple lessons I've shared of planet, earthlings, and thin blue line are the basis of my own personal space, actually life philosophy. I'm excited to share with them with anyone I can. And they are what I believe is the basis for how we all really and truly can live like crewmates, not passengers here on Spaceship Earth. Thank you, have a wonderful day. And I am sure there are going to be some perhaps life-changing uh, ideas shared uh, with all of the, the participants in the audience this morning. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Nicole. Now that was a very, very, um, very uh, clear uh, <laughs> message about, about uh, uh, what we are all about, you know, and um, these missions are very, very important uh, um, for us to understand um, the why we do these things. Thank you so much. We are on to our, uh, our um, first speaker. I think it's uh, Gordon. I, I can see him there. He's joining us from uh, Vancouver uh, area of uh, Canada. And uh, he is uh, the um, chief editor of the Journal of Space Philosophy. And uh, uh, I've known Gordon some years and uh, he's an incredible editor. Gordon, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, we even met once at ISDC in Los Angeles. Okay, let's see if I can share my screen. And go into slideshow. Right, um, next question. Can I actually see? Yes, we can see you well. Yeah, uh, well, the next question is whether I can also see my um, paper. Oh, that's better. <clears throat> okay, so this one is called um, Overcoming Objections to Space Travel. It would be surprising if those attending this gathering weren't solidly in favor of space travel and exploration, including human settlement in space. Gordon, do you, do you want to go full screen? Um, Are you able to do that? I don't mind. Um, the problem is I, I need to see the PowerPoint and my uh, text. So um, I'm not clear. Well, I don't know what the rest of you are seeing. I'm just seeing a panel of um, people on my right. Um, uh, Ken, do you have any suggestions for Gordon? From the beginning. Um, Try me. If, if you want to go full screen, you can click the, the screen icon at the bottom or F5. Um, yeah, I'm slightly lost here. Um, normally I'm pretty good with technology, but I haven't tried to do this before. Okay. Gordon, I think, Gordon, I think you can just see? go to the bottom of your, your main slide that's open and there's the little, all the way, there's where you are right now that's highlighted. Yeah, and then you can go to just the one that does the slideshow. It's right before the um, sizing bar on the bottom of your of your slide. Bottom of my slide. Yep, keep going. Keep going to the right. Keep going to the right and yes. down. Down. Okay. Now go to the left a little bit. Go left. <laughs> and oop, I lost your cursor. Keep going left. Don't don't hit that. And right there, that icon. Hit that. Yeah. And now yeah. you should still be able to see the rest of your screen. That's yeah, it. the problem is I can't see my text now. I think you can oh. just make it smaller <laughs> for yourself on your screen because it's not a real full screen. Um, I think I think Gordon wants to follow his text. I need to follow my text because I haven't okay. memorized it. Okay, then, then go go back to the way it was. I, you know, I, I, yeah, I just, just go, to see. go back. Yeah. Okay. Um, well. I mean, I need to see my text. If that means I can't do the slideshow, then so <laughs> okay, be it. Okay, please, please go ahead. Yeah. So I will stop sharing my screen then. Um, you can put the slides in later. Okay, let's start that again. It would be surprising if those attending this gathering weren't solidly in favor of space travel and exploration, including human settlement in space. However, this view clearly hasn't yet reached the widespread consensus, even though the space age began on October 4th, 1957, and is therefore 64 years old. 
Nevertheless, there are still high profile objectors, most recently Prince William, the grandson of Queen Elizabeth II and second in line to the throne, who suggested it would be better to focus on saving the earth than looking for a new planet to live on. In this paper, I want to explore why this lack of consensus might be and to see if this exploration suggests more productive approaches to persuade doubters. My analysis focuses on the work of Gonzalo Munivar, a philosopher who has written extensively on space issues. So according to Munivar, there are two main types of objection to space exploration. Social critics argue that there are more pressing priorities on Earth. Ideological critics argue that space exploration is an unwise extension of big science and technology. Mm. Prince William's objection is in the social critic category. Ideological critics allege that the case for space exploration is a delusion. It offers more growth and technology to stop the mess caused by growth and technology. If we change our attitudes and stop fouling the environment, space technology will be unnecessary. Their concern is that while scientific approaches may save us from catastrophes in the future, they will certainly degrade the environment now and disturb the natural balance, possibly making an extinction event more likely. Similarly, social critics question the obvious payoffs of missions to Saturn, Uranus and Pluto, rather than focusing on the fields in which space technology is producing direct spin-offs. Some question human endeavor in space rather than space exploration per se. Munivar quotes 1979 Nobel physics laureate Stephen Weinberg's skating critique of manned space flight. According to Weinberg, it has no scientific merit and putting humans in space serves no useful purpose. Becky Cross suggests that some are simply skeptical about the benefits and that it's up to the space community to convince them otherwise. Well, there's been a wide variety of responses. Lynn Harper has pointed to the biotech benefits of labs in space, ranging from high quality cell and tissue cultures, which are much easier to produce in microgravity than on Earth, to developments in the understanding of infectivity aging in agriculture. Others have pointed to the advantages of satellites, which can locate resources as well as monitoring the environment and therefore saving lives by forewarning us about extreme weather. Space exploration, they argue, contributes greatly to the reduction of human misery, the improvement of human life and the preservation of the environment on an ongoing basis. Between 1962 and 1976, there were repeated claims that for every dollar spent in space, there was a return of seven dollars. Um, um, Gordon, yeah? Gordon uh, it appears uh, that we are unable to um, see the slides. Uh, no, um, I know that. I can't show you the okay. slides and see my text. Okay. What do you want the slides or do you want the presentation? <laughs> That's all right. Continue. Um, for every dollar spent in space, there was a return of seven dollars, although this scenario clearly didn't continue into the space shuttle period due to the shuttle's high operating expenses. Nevertheless, proponents can point to many benefits of the space program. So Munivar makes a philosophical case for the serendipity of scientific exploration. He begins by stating that there's a strong connection between scientific change resulting from exploration and serendipity. For example, Einstein began his career by thinking about how the universe would look if one was traveling on a light ray, a question that has no obvious practical application. However, it led him to develop the theory of relativity, which in turn led to the development of quantum theory. These theories indirectly led to the development of lasers, which now have medical applications in microsurgery that could not have been foreseen at the time. Munivar argues that it would have been almost impossible for a surgeon to have developed a medical laser if it required turning the science of the day upside down. Thus, Munivar concludes serendipity is the natural, practically inevitable result of change. And that's where the problem with him starts, because there's an obvious counterexample to this, Chernobyl, and it's not the only one. Technicians there are attempted to determine whether, in the event of a power failure, the slowing turbine could power the emergency equipment and the cooling system until the diesel emergency power supply came on. Certain safety protocols weren't followed, and this, combined with design flaws in the reactor, led to a large explosion at 0123 local time on Saturday, April 19, 26, 1986. It's far from clear that there were any happy accidents in the resulting carnage, or that anything useful was learned from it with the possible exception of don't shut down the safety systems while experimenting on nuclear reactors. The second part of Munivar's argument is that scientific exploration leads to scientific change. This is far more specific, uh, straightforward. 
scientific exploration leads to new knowledge and new ideas which have new consequences and thus refinements of theory and new applications follow thus combining the two stages one scientific exploration leads to scientific change two scientific change leads or may lead to serendipity therefore scientific exploration leads or may lead to serendipity which undermines the social critics claim that spin-offs are achievable without space exploration as transformations in space are often prerequisites for improvements in technology as the theory normally precedes the application this argument also works against the ideological objection because we can't avoid interacting with and transforming the earth as all life has done since it first emerged the question isn't whether we'll do so but how and how wisely while wisdom isn't synonymous with knowledge and our knowledge will never be complete we need knowledge to make wise and informed choices Depriving ourselves of a potentially vast sum of knowledge may be depriving ourselves of the chance to act wisely, and therefore not proceeding with space exploration may be irresponsible. It may not be a false panacea, but an important means to a cleaner and better future. Another concern of the opponents of human spaceflight is the cost, and I would suspect this is largely behind Prince William's objection. Munivar calculates that we could run between 400 and 500 interplanetary missions for the cost of building the ISS. It's undeniable that the shuttle program and the ISS took resources away from other projects. Opponents point out that the cost of a failed unmanned mission is much lower than the cost of a failed manned mission. They also point out that machines have traveled tens of thousands of times further and gathered more knowledge than human space explorers. Nevertheless, these objections are mitigated to some extent by the greatly reduced costs of more recent rockets. However, if there are good reasons to have a permanent presence in space anyway, it would make sense to perform experiments there that might otherwise be economic, as this might lead to a new flowering of science. A human presence in space allows for repairs to space telescopes, most notably Hubble, and the construction of telescopes that are too large to launch from Earth in one piece. It allows the placement of telescopes on the far side of the moon, which would shield them from interference from the earth and could extend the baseline and measurements in interferometry. It allows for the mining of resources and the construction of goods in space without the costs and complications of launching them from earth, such as vibration. Thus, human settlement in space will be useful in the long term, even if the benefits take time to appear. In response to the ideological critics, Munivar points out the disruptions to the natural balance happen all the time and will continue to happen with or without human activity. The development of life changed the chemistry of the planet. This increased oxygen levels, changing the atmosphere and the oceans. The appearance of complex organisms and the formation of an ozone layer also disrupted the status quo. Thus, the critics alleged natural balance is an illusion. Furthermore, eventually natural changes in the environment will make the Earth uninhabitable, whatever we do or don't do. While scientific endeavor and space exploration offer no certainty that we'll gain the knowledge necessary to mitigate changes, without them, we'll have no chance of doing so. Well, the Prince's comment prompts me to ask a related question. Would we get more benefit from spending the money we use on space to address problems on Earth? Put into the form of a hypothesis in its null form, this might read, we would obtain more benefit from investing X million dollars on addressing terrestrial problems than from spending the, space amount, the same amount on space activities. This is a testable hypothesis, although it would be necessary to specify how would quantify the benefits in both cases. It also prompts the logically consequent question, has anyone attempted this comparison? If anyone has, there'll be data we can use as evidence to support or undermine the case for space exploration, and it may be possible to move towards the missing consensus. But as a largely independent scholar with currently limited library access, I haven't been able to do an exhaustive search on this, but the searching I have been able to do suggests that the answer is no. I didn't get a single relevant hit on academia, Google, JSTOR, ResearchGate, or WorldCat. NASA has, of course, done cost-benefit analyses of particular projects, but not, as far as I can find, comparisons between space and terrestrial alternatives. There will be risk in such an analysis, as well, a finding in favour of space endeavour might make it easier to get funding. An unfavourable finding may, might, might make things more difficult. However, as a general rule, having more evidence is preferable to having less evidence. 
This discussion notwithstanding, there's always likely to be dis disagreement on the relative merits of using resources in space and using them to deal with problems on Earth instead. However, to resolve this issue, at least to the point of developing a consensus, more information is needed. Specifically, a comparative analysis of the costs and benefits of these two options, an analysis that doesn't seem to exist. Doing such an analysis might make a major contribution to answering the critics' objections. And that is my offer for this morning. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Gordon. I'm sorry we could not see all those beautiful slides you had, but um, you know, I was, uh, uh, serendipity uh, is a very interesting term in all of our endeavors. And uh, I appreciate that you bringing it up forward. And, uh, and all of us, I believe, in this group also think telescopes are, are one of the ways we experience our universe uh, in real time. And uh, as you know, um, some uh, um, um, very new uh, telescopes uh, are headed out into space as we talk. And uh, uh, I, I really appreciate uh, the point of view that um, uh, you 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 cast right now. Um, uh, thank you very much, Gordon. I hope you'll stay on to the end of the program. We'll have some good discussion. Hopefully. Thank you. Um, we are on to our good friend uh, uh, Jim Crisafuli, who is here from uh, um, who who is listening in and uh, rearing to go from uh, uh, um, the beautiful state of uh, Hawaii. Uh, Jim, uh, uh, please. Please tell us uh, what uh, you have in mind. Aloha. Uh, Ken was going to advance the uh, slides uh, as we move through my okay. presentation uh, this morning. So um, if he, yeah, there we go. So uh, aloha and uh, mahalo nui loa for the opportunity to engage with the AIA community to present our vision for ACES worldwide, the Alliance for Collaboration in the Exploration of Space. Uh, next slide. Uh, humanity is now embarking on a new era of space exploration and development. Both public and private space institutions, educational and training organizations, and regulatory agencies worldwide are pursuing innovative approaches to help advance diverse and pioneering enterprise on the frontiers of space. Uh, opportunities are also being explored to apply space-related technologies and resources in ways that could significantly improve and ultimately help sustain life on our home planet. Uh, next slide. Um, ACES Worldwide uh, is a space-related alliance that has been established to enhance international space ventures that can help make space enterprise more collaborative as well as environmentally sustainable. Uh, known as the Alliance for Collaboration and the Exploration of Space, AC's uh, goal is to promote public-private partnerships in space ventures, to strengthen space education and training programs, uh, to enhance space safety standards, and ultimately to help advance long-term visions for sustainable space activities, making these ventures more equitable, expanding their environmental benefits, and accelerating timetables for peaceful space enterprise and in ways that ultimately could benefit uh, nations worldwide. Uh, next slide. Um, the AC's worldwide vision, it's, this is a multinational space initiative focused on engaging not only major spacefaring nations and their space agencies, but also developing countries, multinational space organizations, uh, entrepreneurial and private space enterprise, uh, diverse educational programs and, and not-for-profit organizations. Um, our ACES Advisories Committee is truly inclusive, uh, engaging representatives from the United States, uh, Italy, Mexico, Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, uh, India, Finland, Greece, Russia, Nigeria, France, New Zealand, the Netherlands, China, Japan, Brazil, and this uh, list keeps growing. So uh, ACES Worldwide is reaching out to both spacefaring and non-spacefaring nations, space agencies, and other space-related organizations 
around the planet, uh, our planet. Uh, this includes members of uh, the International Astronautical Federation, participants in COSPAR, and members and observers of the UN COPLUS program. Several uh, international organizations are currently exploring this effort with our advisory team, including, and I see we have Adriano on board today, Space Renaissance International, uh, McGill University, uh, the International Association for the Advancement of Space Safety, and the International uh, Space University. Uh, next slide. Uh, ACES Worldwide is now working to explore a wide range of space-related issues, uh, beginning with space safety. Uh, this will include public safety during launches, controlled re-entries, commercial space flights, and hypersonic transport, uh, environmental protection and sustainability from space debris, atmospheric and ground pollution and radiation, uh, ground personnel uh, protection and the management of aborted launches, space situational awareness, space traffic control and on-orbit services, uh, global standards and regulations, and of course, cosmic hazards and planetary uh, defense. Uh, next slide. Um, another key issue uh, is orbital space debris. And ACES is working to help advance education, training, and public awareness of key issues in this area, uh, enhance space situ situational awareness, active debris removal and mitigation, uh, space insurance and risk assessment, liability uh, conventions and legal constraints, on orbit servicing, um, space debris reuse for space infrastructure construction, standards for rendezvous and proximity operations, improved debris removal and mitigation policies, and issues related to new large scale uh, LEO constellations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, space education and training will also be a major focus for ACES worldwide. Um, all nations can benefit from space enterprise uh, that will promote student education and training, understanding of the use of space technologies and systems that can help advance economic, environmental, and other key developmental goals. Uh, and in particular, ACES uh, would like to help promote training that will include space tools and analytics to help monitor global pollution, weather, and climate change trends, uh, space education and training that will be key to uh, achieving the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals and innovative teleeducation programs focused on capacity building for nations uh, initiating new space programs. Uh, next slide. Another key area for collaboration uh, will be institutional, <clears throat> legal, and financial arrangements for space initiatives. This will include new types as well as methods for implementing public-private partnerships and international alliances, very important here. The improved educational and training programs, as well as enhanced definitions and concepts related to space systems and activities, and ways to enable long-term sustainability of both space and environmental policies and regulations. Uh, next slide. Um, we're also gonna be focusing on research related to cosmic hazards and planetary defense. Another priority for ACs, especially, especially with regard to uh, coronal mass ejections and solar flares, uh, potentially hazardous asteroids, comets, and how best to defend against them, antimatter and supernovas focusing on cosmic hazards, research and detection systems, and planetary defense systems, uh, preparedness protocols, and the development of solar shields. Next slide, please. Um, you got a minute, Jim. Oh, yeah. Space related education enterprise uh, to enhance sustainability will be a key priority for ACs. This will include development of global sustainability trees and related space applications, uh, development of remote sensing and global pollution monitoring, uh, radio frequency monitoring from space, space systems addressing ocean acidity and global warming, and space systems for monitoring global pollution, as well as new ways to address key sustainability issues. Next slide. ACs will also help promote uh, developmental programs related to lunar and other off-world settlements on the moon and Mars, exploring ethics of expanding civilization in outer space, technologies that will be required to enable sustainable off-world settlements, potential sizes of sustainable space colonies, uh, potential biological seeds for living structures in space, and potential settlements uh, independent of Earth, including how they could be developed, governed, and viably operated. The next slide. 
Finally, we need to consider several key questions regarding the future of ACES, how this initiative optimally could be administered to help realize its potential contributions to global space enterprise. Can a roadmap be developed to help prioritize and guide ACES worldwide activities long-term? But what operational strategies could best initiate and enhance global ACE, uh, engagement with ACES? And are there sustainable roles for lesser developed nations and non-space uh, nations? And if so, how could ACES help realize its opportunities? The final slide, uh, we would uh, welcome feedback from EIA members on any of these issues and opportunities as we collectively collaborate in helping humankind reach for the stars. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's so much to unload there. And uh, uh, good to see you, uh, Jim. Uh, you know, I think um, space, the term that you used, is space is situational awareness um, is, uh, is critical. And uh, I think we are becoming more sensitive to the happenings, not only in our neighborhood in terms of the sun, but uh, through the different instruments we put out, we are uh, becoming more familiar with the happenings in the cosmos. And uh, uh, we'll talk more about that. Thank you so much. Uh, we are headed to our next speaker, and that is Adriano. Now, um, Ken, um, Adriano just emailed uh, us saying that uh, uh, um, he is unable to be with us uh, in real time, but were you able to um, download his- Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I already did. Okay. okay. Let, let us see if we can uh, bring that. Hi, 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 Madhu. However, I'm here, I'm following. Okay. But I, I feel really bad and I, I don't feel myself to, to present live. But okay. this is this was a rehearsal I made this morning, therefore it is fresh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Adriano. Uh, I hope you're feeling better. Uh, uh, um, but we'll watch you, watch your presentation. Thanks, thanks for this opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Adriano Utino, and this is my presentation to the AIAA conference uh, uh, named Space Philosophy Gathering 2021. And my title is Expanding Civilization Behind Earth's Limit and Evolutionary Process. Well, let me share my screen now. Okay. Uh, defining a bit of space on essence and uh, uh, the cosmic humanism that is our uh, uh, philosophy, uh, we can uh, read in the Space on Essence Manifesto that the real world is not found in money, but in new technologies, new solutions, and the potential for work. With almost 8 billion intelligences, humanity has never been so rich. Uh, so this is our core uh, concept humanist concept. Uh, a first consideration can be made on the evolution of evolutionary factors. In the beginning, uh, uh, when the first uh, uh, humans, uh, Neanderthal and the first uh, uh, Homo sapiens, the uh, evolutionary factor was a physical strength. But the, uh, while the, uh, our species evolved as a cultural species, the uh, factor, evolutionary factor, main evolutionary factor is now intelligence. Um, losing 30% of humans would, would uh, mean to lose many precious, intelligent, yet physically weak people. We need to conserve our whole human patrimony, the inter patrimony, the intellectual and social platform necessary to step to the stars. So you want to talk about the value of human patrimony, uh, an helpful Malthusian concept that should never be pronounced again, overpopulation. However, demographic growth is considered a, a big problem and nobody does to discuss demographic growth. There is a, 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 some kind of taboo on it. Uh, we not only refute the concept of overpopulation, the global multi-crisis is due to our growth in a philosophical closet system, not to the growth in itself. We are to constitute the true positive rationale of human growth. We are going now to enumerate a good number of humanist concepts to demonstrate that it's very much better to have many growing brave and young people than a few discouraged old people. Uh, first of all, a growing human patrimony means a growing nursery of good ideas. 
Then we have a growing markets that for poor countries means a possibility of industrialization, wealth, democracy, and freedom. A growing business and jobs for young and less young people. And more opportunities of social growth that uh, from the very indigent uh, situations to a medium, medium wealth, uh, welfare to, uh, uh, to wealth. A growing cultural diversity with the creation of many um, uh, new communities. Uh, avoiding a too elderly society that is a, a factor of decay, a cultural decay of the society. And the joy of being many, working, collaborating, competing, socializing, loving, making children. And the natural instinct, if there are so many billions of people, maybe there will be a girl or a boy for me too. So the growth is key. And our concept is that salvation will be for everybody or it will not be. This is our, uh, our paradigm. Uh, demographic growth brings to markets growth to industrial development, to mass education, to growth of human dignity, to more employment and business, to more hope in the future, to ethical enhancement and progress of civilization. Progress of civilization leads to demographic growth again and to cultural growth. And uh, the cycle, the virtuous cycle can restart. In the center of this uh, uh, cycle, there is arts and science development. That means that numeric and civil growth are strictly interdependent. Uh, this is the core of, our, of, of cosmic humanism. Salvation will be for everybody or it will not be. Compassion and inclusion are great maximum utility for everybody. Offering opportunities of such a growth is key. Helping poor to become wealthy is a key economy booster. Such a growth need space, so resources and energy. Space, resources and energy are plenty available beyond the limits of our planet. Uh, so the industrial society brought uh, many uh, progress uh, uh, con conditions, technology development, economy development, mass health systems, mass education systems, social progress, human dignity, freedom and democracy, growth, and increased nursery of ideas. And uh, a, a, a new class of uh, uh, idealist entrepreneurs that bring to solutions. Uh, on the minus column, we have over-exploitation, of course, pollution, waste of resources, and environmental decay, uh, alienation uh, caused by repetitive work, and uh, uh, natural forms of life, mass extinctions. The point is that the concurrence of these two tendencies, a positive one and a negative one, in a closed environment uh, led to the multiple crises that we are experimenting uh, nowadays. So uh, in its third World Congress, the Space Renaissance discussed a key criterion to evaluate the maturity of civilization to be added to the Kardashev criteria. Uh, that is social inclusiveness. Uh, if, uh, okay, Kardashev wrote uh, the uh, criteria for classifying a, a civilization uh, using the energy of its own planet, type one, uh, using energy of the solar system, type two, using energy of the galaxy, type three. We, we uh, decided to add social inclusiveness as a criteria uh, to ensure equal opportunities to all of its members. This development must be sustainable from all points of view, economic, social, environmental. It is now clear that sustainable development is possible only in outer space using extraterrestrial resources, leaving the human community free to expand, grow, and multiply outside of our mother planet. Earthers can achieve a fully inclusive society only by expanding into outer space. And civilian space development is the achievable utopia for the third, third millennium. Maslow's highest goals available to everyone. So unfortunately, the current uh, vision of the world is pre-Copernical. 
It considers our planet a different thing, closer than separating from the rest of the universe. When they say we don't have a planet B, they mean that we cannot migrate into space. We are still locked in impenetrable crystal balls, as it was in the Middle Age. The good news, Earth is in space. Is not a different, is not different from the rest of the universe. We can naturally expand in this, into the solar system and behind with the help of our natural resources that are curiosity, intelligence, science, and technology. We are immersed in a cosmic ecology. Nature is the same in the whole universe as Plato, Giordano Bruno, Kepler, and other philosophers wisely understood many centuries ago. So, um, Let's have a look in the cultural space renaissance. Our true richness is the people. Uh, there are a couple of contemporary philosophers who developed uh, intrinsic classifications of the human attitudes. Uh, uh, so this is Stephen, Stephen Wolf with his uh, beautiful book, The Obligation. He identified the nine types of the human attitudes, the wanderer, the settler, the inventor, the designer, the builder, the protector, the visionary, the philosophers, and the philosopher and the evolver. And um, Howard Gardner on his side uh, identified uh, these types, uh, different types of intelligence, human intelligence, linguistic, mathematical, logical, musical, visual, spatial, bodily, kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, naturalistic, and existential. So if you only put these two lists uh, uh, of characteristics in a b-dimensional uh, matrix, you get a lot of combination, if, especially if you think that each one of us doesn't have only one of these characteristics, and they have two or three combined in, combined in different percentages. Uh, but if you add the, the geographical uh, axis, you get a cubic matrix with a really big of combination that justify the idea that each human individual is an individual endowed with his own uh, aims, uh, projects, uh, ideas, and, and, and so on. And any tentative tentative to simplify the society, uniforming it to one only human type, neglecting the aims of the other ones, was always a being an arbinger of authoritarianism and dictatorial bureaucracies. The fair management of scarce resources, by the way, uh, it was always a source of dictatorship. Uh, civil, free and democratic development uh, requires abundance of resources to guarantee freedom for all and each human types. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, this is a, a, a slightly evoluted uh, a pyramid of hierarchical needs uh, defined by, by Abraham Maslow in, in uh, uh, 1943. Uh, so we can see that uh, the, the classist utopias like Marxist insisted on the lower um, insisted on equality of the lower levels of the uh, human needs. Uh, biological, physiological safety, and love and belongingness. But if we want to uh, draw uh, to uh, to draw a modern utopia uh, suitable to the space age, we have to consider all of the needs, including the highest ones. It is a transcendence need behind personal self, caring for others. So um, this this should be. Uh, the realm, the, the dominion of a modern uh, utopia. So a, a humanist utopia for the space age uh, should say from each one according to their creativity and availability, and to each one according to their desires and capacity of imagination. That means man does not live by bread alone, and the superfluous is indispensable. The first, okay. Uh, as Kraft Eric wrote in his extraterrestrial imperative, uh, 
beautiful work in 1981, uh, we had a first great crisis uh, that can be seen as the first step of industrialization of life when one particular one cell organism, the photoautotroph, how photoautotroph evolved an enzyme that was capable of utilizing solar energy to produce chemicals that uh, stored energy. Uh, it was the photosynthesis principle. Uh, something terrible happened as in every industrial process, there was pollution, oxygen, product of photosynthesis. The first earth environment was destroyed. Living matter responded negentropically, choosing to leap boldly over the existing limits in interacting with primordial resources by means of a grout trust utilizing eiger technology. The natural history tells a struggle of life of, uh, uh, for, free, for freedom, a struggle of the life for freedom, to get free from entropy and from the ferocious laws of the jungle. You got one minute. In another, uh, in another uh, paper, the anthropology of astronautic craft, Erike, uh, uh, di distinguish uh, some steps of the uh, other intermediate steps of liberation. With a few exceptions, after exiting the sea, animals remained crawling. Their bodies were in close contact with the ground, resulting in extensive heat exchange. Hence, their blood temperature followed, and today still follows that of a ground temperature. The development of mammals, the most versatile and perfect land animal was a brilliant biotechnical achievement. Divorcing the body from the ground by means of legs freed the body from slavishing following the temperature cycle of the soil, permitted the development of insulating force and allowed the maintenance of a fairly constant temperature. Now it was no longer necessary to lie eggs and depend uh, on the sun for etching. Therewith, life became mostly uh, almost independent of climatic conditions. The conquest of the land could be completed. Also, the lower atmosphere could be occupied in time by follows on developments of the reptiles, which showed a better grow potential for this environment than mammals. And finally, we have the, uh, we are developing uh, the, the tools to go outside and free ourselves from the uh, uh, the the, uh, the uh, gravity well of our mother planet. Okay. Hey, thank we you. are facing now the second great crisis. <laughs> we don't want to destroy the second earth while building the third one. The Wamba metaphor is particularly appropriate. The child who was at first parasitical in the body of the mother later on becomes the protector of the mother. We have the power to help only because we are technologically emancipated. And we have to continue to emancipate ourselves because we are children of the biosphere. We are not pets of the biosphere. Becoming progressively less parasitic and progressively more in control of ourselves, production resources independent of Earth's biospheric warmth, in short, emancipation from planetogenic to cosmogenic state. There is a ninth month in this process. And if the nine month is not uttered to, both the embryo and the mother body are destroyed. Today, this means that if seven or eight billion people fall back on a lifestyle of an embryonic mankind, it will destroy mankind by billions and it will devastate the entire biosphere. biosphere. This is what in the thesis of the third SRI World Congress, we call it the risk of civilization implosion. Going to the end, I want to quote the three fundamental it, laws of astronautic written time, by Krafft um, uh, First time, law, the body and nothing yeah, under the natural I, laws I of the universe it's impose like... any limitation of man except man himself. Second law, not only the Earth, but the entire solar system and as much of the universe as he can reach under the laws of nature are man's rightful field of activity. And the third one, by expanding through the universe, man fulfills his destiny as an element of life, endowed with the power of reason and the wisdom of the moral law within himself. And last, a quoting by uh, Gordon Sumner in Art Sting, that is quite to the point, the world is in crisis, political crisis, pandemic crisis, climate crisis. Music 
but we, we want to read philosophy, should show us a way out of our crisis. I'm not looking for ways to reiterate my problems. I'm looking for solutions, ways to get out. So thank you very much for your attention. Adastra. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Adriano. Uh, uh, these are very interesting slides and the visuals are uh, self-explanatory. Um, Kraft Erike is dear to our community. And uh, he always said that uh, industrialization of space is not about space as much, uh, not about uh, working in space, but creating high quality jobs on planet earth. And uh, uh, I appreciate uh, uh, you bringing up Kraft, Enrique. Let us move on to our next speaker, but Adriano, please stay on. We, we have questions for you. I think our next speaker is Alice. Yes, hello everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Alice is uh, joining us from Australia. As um, uh, um, uh, Adriano talked to us from uh, uh, from um, Italy. So, can everyone see my slide there? Yes, we can. Excellent. So, um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, philosophy gathering, Madhu. You're welcome. So I'd, thank you. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the land of the Wiradjuri people and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I acknowledge their ongoing connections to the lands, waters and skies of their country. And I also extend my respects to the traditional owners of the lands that you're all joining us from today. So I'm gonna be talking about space archeology. span So I'll start with some basic definitions. So people generally think of archeology span as the study of the ancient past, but what it actually is, is a set of theories and methods for studying the human interaction with the material world, with objects and environments and places. So this means you can do archeology span in any time and any place, and this includes space. So generally we say that space archeology span is the study of the places and objects associated with space exploration from about the time of the development of the first vehicle capable of getting into space. And that's the V2 rocket in the late 1930s. So what I'd like to do today is take you on a brief tour of some of the archeological sites and objects that humans have made in the solar system. So this is our itinerary for today. We're going to uh, leap off Earth into low Earth orbit, visit the moon, then we're going on to Venus and Mercury. We're going to miss most of the middle and outer solar system and finish up uh, at, at the very edge, beyond the edge of the solar system. So our first stop is uh, Earth orbit. Currently surrounding the Earth are over 35,000 pieces of space junk that are larger than 10 centimetres. And to put this in another perspective, this is the equivalent in weight of 10 million cane toads. These were an introduced uh, pest into Australia to try and control um, cane, um, cane eating insects that got out of control and now are starting to invade um, the entire country. So I think this is quite a good metaphor for what's going on with space junk at the moment. Uh, with all of this stuff, it's a widely acknowledged problem that we need to actually get rid of some of it. I don't think anyone would dispute that. But not all of these pieces of space junk are equal. Among those dots of light around the planet are some objects which have incredible cultural significance. And this includes the Vanguard One satellite launched in 1958, which is currently the oldest human object in, in orbit. And there are many aspects of its cultural significance I could discuss. But for me, one of the most important is that this satellite mobilized an international network of volunteers to acquire and track it. They were called the moon watchers and you can see a picture of them here. And so this was a, an early example of what we now call um, community science or citizen science. And this space junk also includes the Astralis Oscar 5 satellite, which was an amateur satellite created by a bunch of students from Melbourne University. 
and launched by NASA in 1970. Just like Vanguard One, it also used an international network of volunteers to uh, gather data from it. And now that we're hearing so much about the commercialization of space, I think it's really important to remember that, that amateur and volunteer space has been part of space industry and space exploration from the very beginning. So part of the cultural significance of these two satellites is the fact that they are still in space, that they're still in their original and their intended setting. And I would argue that maybe if we have a choice, we don't want to arbitrarily destroy them in the cleanup of space junk. So now I'm going to leap up to the moon and possibly the most famous uh, human created place on the moon. This is the archeological site of Apollo 11. Uh, also known as Tranquility Base. So you can see two images here of Tranquility Base, which are pretty much how archeologists would conceptualize them as spaces. But there's another strong archeological resonance. And this is in the footprints that were left on the surface of the moon uh, in the Apollo 11 mission. For, for archeologists, we often see them as very similar to a set of uh, footprints made in soft volcanic ash at the site of Lytoli in Tanzania about 3.7 million years ago. So this was some of the first definitive evidence we had that our human ancestors were bipedal. And interestingly, there's a, just recently been a new set of footprints uncovered at the Lytoli site, which suggests that there were more than one um, species of human ancestor who lived at this place at a similar time. So we could kind of look at these two places, Apollo 11 and Lytoli, as sort of bookending a particular human um, trajectory of cultural evolution. So I'm now going to zip across to Venus. People tend to forget about Venus, but it's actually very rich in cultural material, most of it Russian. From 1961 to 1984, the Soviet Union sent many missions to Venus, eight of which managed to land successfully on the surface. And you can see some of those locations in the map on the slide. My personal favorite of these missions is Venera 14. And it's often assumed that because surface conditions on Venus are so harsh, that nothing remains of these spacecraft, that they've melted into pools of metal on the surface. But I actually don't think this is likely to be true. These spacecraft were built to withstand the high surface temperatures and pressures. And there is no reason to believe that they're not still standing on the surface, just like Venera 14 you see here, as kind of silent sentinels until we actually return to Venus. So our last stop in the inner solar system is Mercury. This currently has only one archaeological site. This is the crater where the messenger spacecraft crash landed in 2015. And this crater will look pretty similar to all the others we see on the surface, but it will be distinguished by, by its freshness, by you know, its sharp and clean edges. It may be joined by another crater somewhere around 2026 or 2027, uh, when Bepi Colombo currently um, roaming around the solar system on its way to Mercury uh, is likely to finish its mission life. So just one place on Mercury where humans have made an impact. But thinking about Mercury also makes me realize that we have an assumption that the growth of human space exploration will mean an increase in the number of sites and places where we interact with other planets. And maybe this assumption is mistaken. Maybe there will only ever be two archeological sites on Mercury. So I'm going to skip most of the middle and outer parts of the solar system. Not that there's not some archeological sites there as well, but in the interest of time, I want to uh, zip to a region outside the solar system where the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft are currently the furthest human objects of, of, of places uh, from us here on Earth. Of course, these spacecraft are incredibly well known because both of them carry the famous golden record, which has uh, many voices of people speaking greetings in different languages, 
uh, a raft of different images of Earth and the famous music, which includes some Aboriginal music from Arnhem Land. So it's an extraordinary meta object, if you like. But both voyages are going to run out of power uh, sometime sort of around 2025. They will effectively fall silent. We'll no longer be able to speak to them or hear them. And the, the thought of this fills me with great sadness. Now, I'll leave this part of the universe and we're going to zip back into the solar system. But on our way, we'll make a last minute stop because we come across another extraordinary object. And if you can see this slide properly, you can see there's a little image of a red car in the middle there. So this is a famous red sports car that was launched into space in 2018. It's currently orbiting the sun between Mars and Jupiter. But because it wasn't ever intended to go into orbit, it was not designed to be a space object. It's literally just a car. It wasn't uh, hardened or shielded in any way. So by now it's likely incredibly weathered. There's probably, eventually there'll be very little left of the car body itself because a lot of it is carbon based. So of all of the things we've left in the solar system, there's also gonna be this weird skeleton of a car, which will be baffling, I think, to future archeologists. Like, why would you even do something like this? So, so in its own way, it's as intriguing as the Voyager spacecraft. So this is my last slide, Madhu, if we're conscious of uh, time passing. So what, what does all of this mean? I have a few reflections on, on interpreting the archaeological record of space. <clears throat> the first of these is, is in archaeological terms, the entire solar system has now become a cultural landscape. This is defined as a landscape which is the combined works of human processes and natural processes. So it's not the natural cosmos into which we have put a bunch of stuff. It is actually now a combination of these things. And this cultural landscape is our cultural heritage, the cultural heritage of, of different communities and nations and people on earth. So it is a way of connecting to what humans are doing in space. It doesn't always have to be a positive connection either. It can equally be a negative connection but the materiality of these places and their associations uh, are actually a, an entree into understanding space for, for people outside the sort of narrow space community. We've also started putting stuff, terrestrial material into space in, you know, as very small numbers and very low weight, you could say, but this is a very Anthropocene process. This is on Earth, the Anthropocene is about the redistribution of elements and minerals, uh, as we see in the atmosphere, for example. So we're starting to enact that process on Earth. We're starting to redistribute material in the solar system from our planet uh, into different parts. And as space mining grows, uh, effectively, we're starting to dismantle our planet and to dismantle other planets. And this could end up in a, a Kardashev type situation, you could argue. All of these locations and these spacecraft in the rest of the solar system do something else as well. They're like extensions of human senses. They're our eyes and our ears and other senses that our bodies don't have uh, out there in the solar system and beyond uh, apprehending it in different ways. So. Humans on Earth, in fact, have, have developed almost a distributed consciousness. We've, we've become a, a kind of a cyborg creation, uh, which encompasses the entire solar system, even if we're not always conscious of it and we don't think of it like this. The other aspect of this archaeological record is that different parts of it uh, have involved humans adapting to different kinds of gravity. So far, human bodies have been in, in three types. We've, we've got 1G, Earth normal gravity, the microgravity of Earth orbit, where the International Space Station is, one sixth of Earth gravity on the moon. And the technologies we use to adapt our lives to, or their lives to these different gravities, provides us a lens to look back on Earth and comprehend the role of gravity in shaping human material culture and human evolution. 
so that alone, I think, is a reason to be interested in space archaeology. But finally, to finish, if we look at this archaeological record as a whole, something that strikes me is that this is not the archaeological record of a space-faring species, uh, nor yet even of a multi-planetary species, as some argue humans should become. One thing that's lacking from this archaeological record is something that is a constant uh, on Earth, and that is human burials, so the, the deposition of human bodies uh, who die in a different location. And just as the archaeological record on Earth is now showing us how complex human lineages are, we may have to abandon the idea of a unified human species with a single or simple relationship to the cosmos. And that's it from me, the end. Thank you. Beautiful, wonderful. So much, so much food for thought, Alice. Um, I'm so glad uh, you pitched this. You know, I'm thinking that if, uh, if we don't do archaeology, there may be other 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 things out there that's already doing archaeology. But uh, and it's so so nice to hear hear your thoughts uh, on this uh, evolving subject in which you are a pioneer. Um, thank you so much. Um, you know this this is a nice segue into what Kaya is doing and. Uh, also in Australia, um, and she's with us. Uh, and would you like to go now? Uh, there we go. Um, okay, so I just mute, unmuted myself. Hope you can see my screen. Okay. And you can hear me properly. Um, so um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, thank you for giving me this um, opportunity to speak at the Space Philosophy Gathering. Um, I also wish to begin by acknowledging the Borowurm people of the Kulu Nations, uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm presenting uh, from here um, in Melbourne, Australia. And I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging of all the lands on which we do our business today. So my discussion will be um, focused on a more applied approach, how museums could support mental, emotion, and identity needs of people living and working in isolated, confined, and extreme environments of space um, through extended reality experiences integrated into also a daily exercise routine. So speaking of space, digital transformation, advancement of factoring, and industry 4.0 as critical enablers of the entrepreneurial innovation-driven movement of so-called new space are democratizing the previously closed uh, space sector. So as a rapidly changing and growing area, space industry requires a transdisciplinary approach from both STEM, so this is science, technology, engineering and maths, as well as has um, humanities and social sciences. So human space explorations present not only technical challenges, but also health and well-being associated concerns. If we want to go to space to thrive, as uh, we've heard today, and not only to survive, all aspects of human life have to be considered. So it is well known that weakening and deterioration of muscles in microgravity is one of the most prevailing concerns of human space exploration. And as a countermeasure, astronauts, for example, spend uh, 2.5 hours per day just exercising. So they report that the routine is monotonous uh, and they also soon lose motivation to interact with uh, fitness equipment. So how can we create more engaging exercise routine using gamified uh, extended reality experiences? By extended reality or XR, I mean all levels of re uh, reality, from augmented reality, uh, mixed reality, and also to total immersion of virtual reality. Extended reality has always been uh, tested on the ISS, and a recent article by NASA shows a variety of different ways of use. For instance, VR, it's used for remote operation of robots. On the other side, AR assists with the maintenance of the equipment. 
the European Space Agency is also exploring how immersive experiences can increase motivation to exercise. Further from that, can XR also support mental health and well being on the deeper emotional and identity level? So, we propose the implementation of museum and heritage experiences to assist uh, humans being more connected with Earth and to provide a sense of familiarity and belonging. Let's look into a few definitions. Um, as per UNESCO, heritage is our legacy from the past, what we live with today, and what we pass on to future generations. Our culture and natural heritage are both irreplaceable sources of life and also inspiration. The heritage can be divided into tangible and intangible heritage, or material heritage is further divided into movable heritage. So those are objects uh, we usually find in museums. Uh, immovable heritage are buildings, archaeological sites, and uh, land. And relatively new concept is intangible heritage, such as traditions, performing arts, uh, as well as knowledge and skills. So on the other side, the current museum definition by ICOM from 2007 says that museums um, are nonprofit permanent institutions in the service of society and its development open to public, which acquires, conserves, research, communicates, and also exhibits tangible and intangible heritage uh, of humanity and its environment uh, for the purpose of education, study, and enjoyment. However, a new definition is currently being developed as a response to the evolving role of museum in society using consultation approach of four cycles. So the cycle two was about defining keywords to be included in the definition using a structure asking um, what museum is, what it does, and for whom. So the next few slides show a selection of most recent results of those key concepts to be included in the new definition. For example, what a museum does, beside research and preservation, most of the respondents think museums also collect and exhibit. Other highly mentioned term was communication, interpretation, acquisition, safeguarding, and the uh, documentation. About what do people experience at a museum? Uh, education is the most mentioned term, following by knowledge, dialogue, and enjoyment or entertainment. Interestingly, uh, as high as 17% of respondents think museums also contribute to well being. And in regards to what values shape museums, most uh, committees think that museums should be inclusive, sustainable, accessible, diverse, and also serve to society. So that's um, it's really interesting, and uh, it will be um, it will be really interesting to see um, the shape of the final accepted definition next year, and also how the museum definition will be aligned also with our future spacefaring society. Um, okay, that was too fast. Uh, up until recently, uh, museums were mostly involved in space exploration through collecting and exhibiting space-related objects, including technical heritage and memorabilia. So in relation to audience engagement, the main purpose of space museums is still often seen as a vehicle for STEM outreach. With no doubt, such museum exhibitions are important for inspiration of people on Earth. But in regards to what values uh, shape museums, um, I'm sorry, um, uh, in addition, uh, new initiatives are emerging, focused also to preserve both geological and human heritage in outer space and on celestial bodies to ensure a sustainable environment and inspiration for future generations. So I'm sure our audience is well familiar with those uh, space initiatives, um, but perhaps maybe I'll need to mention the upper left uh, images featuring the American Alliance of Museums, special issue of Museum 2040, 
uh, from 2017, and that was featuring two space-related initiatives, one being a pop-up intergalactic museum, and the other a satellite collection storage aiming to protect and preserve museum objects uh, from climate change consequences on Earth. So going back to our proposal, we're currently teaming up with a psychologist, Dr. Anahita Anazami from the UK, a colleague from Deakin University School of IT, um, Dr. Bahari Nikisa, uh, as well as with space designer Kaori Vitsuril uh, from space tech startup Darium Labs in Mexico, uh, and the founder of the Interplanetary Creative Society. So previous studies by other researchers in the area of space medicine suggests that experiencing natural landscape in virtual reality can reduce stress of people working in such environments. So this was tested on analog uh, missions in Hawaii and in Canada. Another research to be looked into uh, as a reference is also trans-migrant displacement studies, especially about culture and identity displacement. So our concept adopts a holistic growth uh, strategy called EPIC Resilience by Sally Dominguez. Um, in this case, EPIC stands for emotional, physical, intellectual, and creative resilience. So we're also in discussion with Australian Indigenous co colleagues mm -hmm. uh, to potentially integrate Indigenous system of knowledge and a holistic approach to health and well-being. So this initiative is also a valuable learning platform for our students. At Deakin uh, School of Engineering, um, students are currently uh, working on a gamifying uh, exercise equipment for astronauts um, and on uh, the supervisor of those uh, projects. And at the same um, time, uh, Design Challenge has also been introduced into the engineering design unit that I'm chairing. Uh, with more than 20 students. So they are currently uh, halfway through the 11 teaching weeks and the images on the right uh, are a few selected concepts from Wednesday submission of their first uh, assignment. So in terms of research, we're planning uh, first to develop an XR pilot content in partnership with uh, content providers. Here you can see a 3D repository by the Smithsonian as an example of one um, uh, online collection uh, that could be re reused uh, in XR. But how do we uh, know this heritage immersive experience could work? To understand this, we are also proposing to design and develop a real-time monitoring system to detect emotions and well-being of astronauts using lightweight wearable sensors. So for the data collection, we are targeting participants at the pre defied uh, analog mission sites and potentially also um, at the ISS. So to conclude, uh, this provides us with a good understanding how immersive museum experiences could support mental health and well-being, not only of astronauts, but also uh, as a space spin-off, such experiences could be used in prisons, in hospitals, retirement villages, and other isolated and um, isolated living and working environments such as in Antarctica, uh, oil rigs or mines. After the global pandemic, um, we may all now uh, really well know uh, from our experiences how important it is to maintain mental health and well-being while being isolated in more or less confined spaces uh, for longer periods of time. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Very, very interesting, uh, Kaya. And you know, museums, um, museums physically um, they take you uh, to what we have done in the past, and um, we um, we are able to uh, at least extrapolate what we can do in the future. And uh, as the saying goes, uh, if you don't know your history, uh, you're bound to repeat it. And uh, um, so I think it's a, it's a brave attempt that, um, that uh, you're doing, particularly in uh, human space flight. Thank you so much, Kaya. Uh, but stay on if you can to, the, um, to our um, panel gathering. Uh, we'd love to uh, ask some questions. Um, our next speaker is Ivitasa 
uh, Steve Durst. Uh, I've known him many years, also from Hawaii, um, you know, with wonderful visions for uh, for uh, space activity. Steve, are you uh, with us? And I hope uh, you'll stay. Oh, we still have time because Steve wanted to uh, leave before noon. Um, uh, Ken, is Steve with us? Is that better? Madhu, aloha. Hello, uh, hello, uh, Steve. How, how, how are things in paradise? Uh, it's a, a lovely day here. I'm looking forward to uh, to going up Mauna Kea after, after our program today, Madhu. How okay. are you? Okay, please continue. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Uh, you uh, uh, Ken, do you think he, should, he needs to be a little bit louder or he's okay? I think you're fine, Steve. Go for it. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's okay, being... but don't see his, his face. Okay. Uh, okay, let, let me try and, and share my screen. And we can begin. Okay. And, uh, uh, all right, well, alo aloha everybody from uh, Kamawela, Hawaii on the Big Island. Uh, and I'm sitting within sight of uh, Mauna Kea where I uh, hope to uh, do some, have some meetings after our, our program here. And I'm very, very happy to have this uh, uh, opportunity to participate in your AIAA uh, Los Angeles, Las Vegas space philosophy gathering and to reconnect uh, with Madhu, as he mentioned, we go back uh, some decades. Um, yes, we do. Uh, and um, to see this opportunity uh, come along, this, this presentation uh, had been submitted before I found out about this gathering for the NASA Lunar Science Surface uh, Lunar Surface Science Workshop in late January, and then uh, by the name of Egalitarian Considerations for Inclusion, Diversity, Ethics, and Best Practices on the Moon. That is the paper that I submitted for late January to NASA. Uh, finding out about the space philosophy gathering, I sent the abstract to Madhu, and, and he thought it might be appropriate to share. Uh, it's it's somewhat uh, uh, <clears throat> pioneering. It's cursory. Uh, I didn't know that I'd need this paper until the end of January for the NASA uh, event, but I am very appreciative uh, to. Uh, to Madhu and, and Ken Lee and the AIAA for this opportunity of airing a few uh, considerations here, uh, specifically regarding uh, the cis lunar system, uh, our, our closest celestial neighbor, the moon, uh, as we are on the eve, uh, perhaps next year will be for the return to the moon in many ways that this past year has been for, uh, for citizen astronauts and space tourism. In fact, uh, the mission that, that our small precursor telescopes will be riding on may be, may be on its way for the first uh, American spacecraft to attempt a landing on the moon in 50 years. It may be on its way in 80 days. So, uh, there are a number, uh, a wide variety of initiatives uh, that we'll talk about briefly, government and independent preparing to return to touch the moon uh, as we return uh, to our, our new home, uh, this time to stay and for good. The question of how we, we return, I think, uh, becomes uh, immediate and, and uh, somewhat paramount. Uh, there are many, many considerations. And I'm proposing one consideration uh, <clears throat> that we consider equality uh, in our, our uh, 
are uh, reestablishing ourselves as a multi-world civilization uh, for good. We're not going just to touch the moon, we're going to stay. And from an American uh, a USA point of view, uh, equality really is comes with our birthright. And sometimes we forget that equality is the first truth to be held self-evident in, in the USA Declaration of Independence, along with, but, but even before, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And egalitarian considerations have have a variety of implications and applications from individual, social, uh, political, economic, and beyond, uh, cultural, spiritual, uh, international, and in this case, interplanetary, uh, interworld. Uh, the question of, of property rights, uh, again, as soon as, uh, as, soon as uh, landings are, are a fact and before, uh, the, these questions are rising uh, with increasing frequency, as they have been since the beginning of the Apollo, Apollo era, even before. Uh, lunar acreage, in other words, uh, how the surface of the moon, and there probably will be different uh, units of measurement besides acres, um, how they will be utilized is, is, is a key question, environmentally as well as economically. Uh, what are we talking about then? Uh, cislunar, uh, Earth, Moon, and, and from, from our, our world, uh, we're approaching 8 billion of us. Um, and I can remember 50 years ago when, when a, a pioneer named Buckminster Fuller talked about 4 billion billionaires, uh, and now they're twice as many. Um, in 193 uh, member members of the United Nations plus two observers, namely, uh, namely Palestine and the Vatican, uh, working in a $100 trillion GNP, a GDP, global GDP. Both of those figures for the number of our fellow travelers on spaceship Earth of 8 billion uh, and 100 trillion uh, GDP uh, are, are arriving about two years from now. And they'll all be uh, in, in various ways and forms, considerations and engaged uh, in this, we call a cislunar superhighway. Uh, that's a graphic that we, we designed maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, <clears throat> and just uh, what, what is the infrastructure that we see on the horizon of this uh, cislunar system? And I don't think that, Again, this is fairly cursory presentation or slide, slide preparation, but there should be a, uh, uh, a SpaceX Starship in that cislunar loop, a, a uh, SLS Orion, um, maybe a, a Long March, a Long March 9, uh, Tian Gang, uh, and a, a Gagayan from India. Uh, we already have go moving forward the Artemis Accords uh, initiated by, by USA uh, and working with, with uh, other nations. Uh, China and, and Russia uh, initiated the Lunar uh, Research Station, not necessarily competitive. They certainly, there are certainly many uh, dimensions for collaboration between those two so far major initiatives. Uh, and I just, just this morning saw that the, there, there's feasibility for even a, a China moon flight as early as 2026, uh, which would put it somewhat after the, the Artemis first woman return uh, in 2025. And, and uh, all manner of, of, of clips, uh, a commercial lunar uh, payload system uh, program of the NASA Artemis uh, initiative that includes the spacecraft that, that we're on, that our ILOA organization. I didn't mention that, that I'm the director here in Hawaii at the International Lunar Observatory Association. So all manner of, of, of efforts, uh, uh, sooner rather than later, uh, next year, uh, perhaps the, the, uh, the, the intuitive machines, SpaceX mission that our ILOA, ILOA instruments are and would be the, uh, again, the first in 50 years for USA, Russia, India, Japan, uh, all have mission 
landing missions, that is, for the moon next year. So going back to that statement uh, for considerations of how we go forward that cuts across many dimensions, both on the moon and, and on earth, uh, I do want to reemphasize uh, equality. Um, maybe when we, we return, uh, that we'll have a new plaque that expands on in peace for all to in peace, freedom and equality for all. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps the first woman will put that uh, plaque on the moon. And as we all, all, uh, all of us lunar enterprise folks know very well, the moon is not just a, not just a, a static rock, but it's the, the launch pad to the, to the solar system and gateway to the stars. Um, these, these, uh, next three slides were presented, um, 10 or 10 or 11 and I do, I'll wrap up in the next minute or two. Um, if that's okay, if I can do that. Um, we're presented uh, 11 years ago at a, a unique uh, conference, a, a kind of a, a revived Space Studies Institute conference that hadn't been held for 10 years. That was the organization Jerry O'Neill formed. Uh, it was a one-off in Silicon Valley, and I made this presentation about what uh, the International Lunar Observatory flagship uh, and this mission we're on won't be uh, considering these matters uh, directly, uh, but on a flagship mission where we have a full spacecraft, landing legs could be tasked to, to imprint whatever one wants to imprint, one's initials uh, as, as a, uh, you know, this question again, uh, who owns the moon has been as old as the Apollo program and way before. Uh, in fact, I'm, I was happy to see that earlier uh, reference to Kraft Erika, who had so many scenarios for how the moon was going to be developed and down to the square square meter. And I heard a similar uh, virtual uh, reality presentation. A fellow in, in, in the Canary Islands of Tenerife had been working for 30 years on this, this uh, scenario for how the, how the moon would be developed down to the square millimeter practically. So, uh, and people have been um, claiming the moon and selling lunar deeds for a long time, but if that's all theoretical, because now we're, we're preparing to touch the moon. And so I think we are, as we return uh, to our existence as a, a multi-world, uh, multi not just species, but when women are back with men as a multi-world civilization, um, the, the question of, of how we go back of property rights there on that previous slide, the landing leg could um, have any number of uh, stamps, marks made, could be divided into tenths or the 360 degrees. Uh, and this is, uh, again, comes from 10, 11 years ago. And uh, I certainly will be updating this by the time of the NASA uh, uh, workshop, but, you know why? Why? Uh, why property rights? What? What? What is the role of uh, independent landers such as ILO? Uh, again, from from a we, uh, at least a, a USA Western point of view, uh, individual uh, land ownership is is fundamental, um, and I believe that's that's like uh, <clears throat> liberty and equality are the two two predominant secular Western principles, and that manifests in. Uh, so the so-called American dream of home ownership, um, and you know why shouldn't uh, the, sur the the surface of a, of of the moon, uh, to some degree, like here on Earth, uh, be be decided on individual uh, claims, uh, individual claim of a right to vote, suffrage, long long sought after and fought for? Uh, why shouldn't that claim? Uh, stand up in terms of the common heritage. Uh, the idea of lunar acreage or any any uh, lunar surface unit uh, I see as a, a a meeting point between those those perennial uh, principles of, of freedom and, and equality, liberty and justice. Uh, it so happens they're they're ten billion acres, a little less uh, unless you count crater slopes. Um, and as I said, approaching 8 billion individuals. So if, if property rights are, are ever advanced and established on, 
on any kind of an individual basis. Um, perhaps one of the first uh, uh, egalitarian steps one might take would be to, to grant 50% of one's claim back to the common commonwealth and future generations. Uh, the, these ideas I hope to advance, not just with NASA next month, but throughout the space community, uh, both, both uh, domestic and, and global. And that's about it from, from Hawaii here. Uh, you know, we're aiming for the, for the stars, the galaxy stars via the moon and, and Jupiter and Mars as well. Um, so thank you very much, Madhu, and for your time. And uh, appreciate the presentations by, by the other folks and associates. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. I don't know um, many people um, as indefatigable as you are uh, in your pursuits. And uh, um, good luck with the ILOA progress that I watch carefully. And uh, uh, I, I wish you the best, Steve. Uh, uh, let us know when you're back at Stanford or in Southern California. I'd love sure. to catch up. Sure, thank while. you, Madhu. Thank, um, you. thank you for the opportunity. We are on to our next speaker. Anita, you're not the next speaker. I think Samir is the next speaker. Am I right, Ken? Yes. And when does Anita speak? Anita, after uh, Professor El is that is that good, Anita? Or, or do you have a, um, a scheduling problem? Let me see. Oh, I just wanted to know the time. I I wasn't sure. Okay, okay. It's you know because we we did some shuffling around in the. Um, I, 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 I worry sometimes our schedule is confusing, but the, you're, you're, you're going right after Samir. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, good. Um, and now I want to introduce my, my new friend, uh, um, Samir El Sayari, who is with us uh, from the Alexandria. real Alexandria, not Alexandria, yes. Virginia, but- No, Alexandria, Alexandria Egypt. In Egypt. Yeah, I the, just the, the uh, arrived Egypt. yesterday. Yeah. The libraries have existed where uh, uh, we are still searching for the remains of uh, uh, Queen uh, Cleopatra. Um, and Samara, the tomb of the Alexander. Uh, uh, so we, we are happy to have you. What is the time there right now? Well, thank you so much. It's uh, almost 10 p.m. Okay, good. So, you, yeah. so you're, still, you're still steady. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. Okay. Uh, so thank you, you so much, Professor Meadow, for this uh, gathering tonight and uh, for having the opportunity to be gathered with the brightest mind I can even imagine. So uh, please let me share my screen and start yes, my, my existential questions. So I have a question that that was the, uh, the, the focus of my presentation. Oh, just, just a second, something here I have to do. Okay, so it's it's obvious, right? You can see my presentation, yes, I think. Yes, we can. Okay, just in a for, second. Yeah. yeah, here you go. Okay, so I'm, I'm raising questions. I am raising a debate today. Our future after the space or the post-space exploration and uh, starting the space colonization. Would it be st a start of a dystopian future? or a utopian future? It is, it's an, a very old debate and maybe it's a cliche, but I would like to raise it through a, a series of projects that I've been working on in the last 10 years. So that old questions, according to science, we have many, many existential risks, maybe 10 anthropogenic, which is man-made and non-anthropogenic, which are only six of them. So uh, many of the scientists, including Stephen Hawking, including many others, had uh, always believed that uh, leaving earth to a new frontier or a new space, uh, environment is a plan B for humanity, just to escape our deserted Earth. But the real question, is it a dystopian future or space exploration and space colonization will bring us new opportunities? I always have a quote 
the same science that will be used for Mars terraforming, it will be the same science that could be applied to fight climate change. The space science that would be developed for space medicine, for our bodies to be engineered, to resist and to be shielded against the global cosmic rays and the, the, the gamma rays, sorry, it will be the same that will be used to fight cancer on Earth. So there is an opportunity today as we are waking, walking in our streets, we have almost 40 to 45% of the inventions in our homes and our streets are originally developed for space uh, technology. Microwaves, LED lamps, dried milk, dried food, anti-scratch lenses, name it, and the list goes on and on and on. So with the same cycle going on, first project is Noah's Ark. I'll just give a very, very brief summary according to the time just to stick to that our schedule so it, it is not an extensive uh, presentation about the research done behind each project but there is a lot of work that maybe in another gathering could be shared more noah's ark is a heavy lifter that will be circling in the uh, uh, low earth orbit uh, with a low less, low passive technologies uh, carrying our dna maps carrying maybe some of our embryos in a cryogenic state it will be a, a vision for plan B or for what I'm telling the dystopian future. But on the other hand, also, we have another opportunity to thrive, to start a new civilization, to start actually the third phase of colonization. According to anthropologists, we have four phases of colonization. First one is, is to stick your flag in a new land and declare that you have discovered it. And we have already started that in 1969 in Apollo 11. The second phase is make a temporary outpost or a temporary shelter where a new, new immigrants would just uh, go and explore the new land and they are still connected to their motherland. And the third phase, which is the focus of my work, is the permanent immigrants who would declare the new land as their home. And of course, the fourth one is declaring independence and a new generation will be born on this land. And I cannot imagine this uh, far future yet. But with, this, with the Project Lunar Oasis, it is an opportunity to start a new uh, a new civilization, maybe a new uh, species of our interplanetary species. And for sure, it will start also the space economy, a new opportunity, and associated with also new notions and the space trillionaires and start to gather resources and ship it back to Earth. So starting not deplete, not the Earth depletion or our resources depletion for the space exploration, it is rather gathering new resources and shipping it back to Earth, capturing new asteroids and breaking them down into pieces and start to rejuvenate Earth again with the resources depleted uh, all over the history. This is a, just a very fast glimpse of the project. And of course, by developing the technology that will be used in such a project that like the mobile, uh, lightweight nuclear reactors and even the fusion reactor, which this uh, project was originally built upon. At that time, I, I had the vision that uh, after five years, we will be having this kind of technology. But now, as the necessity is the mother of all inventions, now we have the necessity. So we are accelerating the invention space and the technology association to build such an endeavor. And also Mars, the twin, the twin colony of the lunar oasis, we have the Martian oasis, inspired by Elon Musk years ago and his vision to make the same project with the same name, the oasis, and start developing the Martian oasis. The Martian oasis is a, t is a little bit slightly different from the lunar oasis according to the planetary uh, differences between Mars and Moon, and according to the new atmosphere with the new vari var variables inside it. <clears throat> so it is designed not to be shielded in a, a lunar cave as the, as the lunar oasis, but to be exposed to the new atmosphere and to interact with the new atmosphere and try to gain energy from the dynamics of the wind with the piezoelectric energy technology. And also and it's, uh, designed and developed according to many papers that were published and the findings about the re re uh, circadian rhythm and our claustrophobic uh, problems. And before, way before the metaverse technology was invented, I had a vision to gather one family from three different planets just in one place to interact and to start to socialize using the VR technology or the metaverse. And here the metaverse will be an existential necessity. It will be gathering different people from different planets all over together. And also the same metaverse technology that will be uh, developed using a link of data 
uh, through a set of satellites linking data together. And now we can operate even robotics. If, you would, if we don't really want to physically try to be transported into the new planet, we can operate on our earth remotely the robotics that will be harnessing and gathering the resources on the different planets and start shipping it back to earth and even maybe beyond and beyond we could be 3d printing and 3d scanning first artifacts from martian uh, geography and martian findings and, and uh, even starting a new kind of archaeology on mars and on moon and start shipping it as digital files of course registered as an, a non-fungible tokens or an, a new kind of a, the nft and to be 3d printed on earth triggering a new kind of economy and then the tree of life it is a new kind of uh, hybrid kind of science, interdisciplinary kind of science, gathering the botanical science and the electro uh, mechanics and even genetic engineering, a new kind of genetic engineering and um, turning the problems on the Martian surface into a new possibilities. According to the high level of uh, storms and winds and the high dynamic movement of those winds that could be harnessed into an energy that would be powering the new plants. And those kind of plants might be developed genetically and uh, creating a, a stronger and better and more efficient and more uh, seedlings kind of plants, which could be also developing our uh, agriculture here on earth and maybe starting a new kind of horticulture. And for our health, the space medicine, I do believe in the space medicine and the possibilities and the opportunity that would be triggered and starting the space medicine. Uh, the 3D printing and the molecular level 3D printing that might even print new kind of corpses in our better shapes in our youth in the 25 year maybe to be reused again and we can reuse our liver, our heart, our lungs even in our elderly times. So this kind of possibilities, I do believe that the space exploration and the space colonization will force us to step up to the maybe exceeding the type one Kardashev scale to a new kind of technology that would be developed originally for space, but could be applied on earth. And inspired from the bone structure, that was the first algorithm that I have tried to do using the parametric design and start building a new kind of a hybrid projects that is carrying our DNA uh, implanted inside the structure and even having the technology to download our conscious. It's not a uh, developed kind of an AI conscious, but it's a human conscious that is uh, saved in an AI container. Now you can talk to Albert Einstein for like centuries to come. You can talk and you can even, uh, you can discuss existential questions and theories and try to use the new kind of AI, which is originally the Einstein's mind downloaded into the AI to start to, to start to find new findings. This is my vision to the future. And the new kind of hybrid architecture or structures, which I call the, the Stonehenge uh, Chimera project. Chimera is a hybrid kind of uh, structure carrying our DNA map and traces of our human uh, legacy, I can, I can say, into a structure that is also carrying our cultural uh, print to stand as a stone structure for the future and centuries to come. And we cannot talk about the space economy without thinking about the new kind of railroad systems. I do imagine that someday uh, SpaceX will turn into the new kind of Airbus or Boeing, developing a new kind of spaceships and space buses. And in also fusion, the fusion of the Hyperloop invention and the space elevators into a new kind of a space elevator that will be uh, having will be enabling our new space economy with a very low cost kind of transportation and having a heavy traffic daily transportation between earth and moon and mars and triggering what i can say the new silk road between our solar system and this kind of invention since it has started and started this project I was uh, following the development of the nanocarbon tubes and the, at the start of that project, we have successfully, not me, of course, I mean the work of other scientists, we have as human beings successfully uh, produced like 15 millimeters of the carbon nanotubes. And recently we have proceeded into a 70 centimeter of the carbon nanotubes. And I do believe in the second 
couple of decades, maybe two or three decades, we will be having a real space elevator, depending on new kind of technologies. But also the important question, can you just imagine this kind of technology applied here on Earth and the potentials that it will be carrying in the development of our structure, our civilization, our inventions here on Earth? Sorry. So this will be the new railroad gathering and harnessing the helium-3 and maybe a new uh, findings and new resources and shipping it back to Earth and starting a new kind of space tourism. And talking about space tourism, the, the, the subterranean kind, the subterranean part of this project will be also housed inside a lunar cave. And this lunar cave will be the house for the new space economy. This is just a very uh, schematic diagram of the internal transportation and the external transportation system that will be linking our uh, solar system. We will be having many versions of the same space elevator. And inspired by our old legacy here on Earth, like the anthropization or trying to trim nature and to shape nature to serve our needs. And the new kind of anthropization also will be used inside the lunar caves, covered with an airtight construction but creating a new kind of environment and a controlled environmental life support system, a kind of environment and an outpost that people will not be counting moments to leave to Earth, but will be counting moments of joyable memories of their stay and wish to stay more even under this kind of structures. Those are just uh, renderings of the proposed design. So it was about importing part of Mother Earth to a new hostile environment, to a new kind of environment, and try to breathe and smell and taste and touch part of the new Earth or the new environment that we have successfully imported to the new hostile environment. So this is my vision about the new space Silk Road, which is originally developed on Earth maybe hundreds of years ago, to start a new kind of trade and sharing resources among civilizations at that time. And it will be applied with the same principles into the, into the new uh, frontiers or the new uh, world. It is about creating a new world order. And of course, that means that the blockchain technology will also be advanced to serve our needs. And my my vision was something called the aqua currency, linking the new kind of uh, uh, cryptocurrency with the most valuable resource in the solar system, which will be the water, aqua. And of course, we need uh, uh, gas stations all over the, the path of the new Silk Road to start beaming low microwave kind of electrical energy to the new heavy lifters or even to the shipments that will be transported maybe through the new uh, space elevators and start paying the price of that gas in cryptocurrency to those stations as well. And inspired by the same mindset for designing for space, I'm an architect originally, and also the application of this kind of new methodologies and mindset into Earth and the iHouse project was created. It is also, it is a very simple project, minimalistic, but inside it, it is a very sophisticated kind of architecture that carries many values of uh, derived from the space technology and inspired by uh, scientific research done in that domain. And also designed upon a simplified version of the International Space Station life support system. That is the schematic diagram of the original ISS. But by simplifying this, designing an element now the future house or the house that could be produced will be producing its own food, water, energy, and uh, even contribute to nature and act as nature, not depleting its resources, but uh, uh, contributing to resources and in enriching a new kind of resources. And this is a scientific work which were uh, utilized inside it, a lot of simulation softwares, a lot of papers, and that is part of the work done to develop the simple white box that was shown a little bit earlier, a couple of uh, slides ago, with a zero energy uh, kind of architecture. And all of the previous projects were awarded projects internationally, but after even uh, being awarded, 
the, the development of this project didn't stop. Actually, it had started into a new kind also and testing it uh, uh, with the CFD to harness the power of uh, wind to generate maybe more energy and try to clean the air and utilize that clean air inside the house. And also using the kind of new technologies like the transparent aluminum or the alum, aluminum oxynitride into a new kind of architecture. This is like six times much stronger than the bulletproof kind of glass. This kind of glass fusing it with a transparent solar panels will also be used in creating a new kind of space architecture, but built on earth. You can see the toilets here with a rounded shape to gather all uh, of the microbial life form or the viral life form into by the gravity <clears throat> into the ground and for the ease of cleanliness of this. Also inspired by the sleeping quarters inside the ISS, now each bedroom could be moved and uh, transported into a new location according to the desire of the residents. And even the disinfection and uh, using the hydroponic inside hydroponic farming system or the precision farming outside. So this house will be an operating machine with or without its users. It will be an operating machine that can provide its own uh, food. And you can find here also the, so the sails that could be harnessing energy and gathering all the rainfall and uh, uh, filtering it into a new uh, drinking water uh, underground uh, reserves, reservoirs. So it will be a house that can produce its own food, its own water, its own energy, and can protect even against entry or uh, by having that transparent aluminum that I have discussed earlier. You can find all of the roof will be also covered with a semi-transparent kind of solar panels that will be enabling the sunlight to enter, but at the same time gathering more energy for, for light. You got one minute, Samir. So, yeah, and that was the final slide. I do believe in those three quotes. The future belongs to those who dare to dream. And completing on that quote by Eleanor Roosevelt, the future also belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And finishing by Malcolm X quote, the future belongs to those who prepare for today. So we have to dream and then believe in the power of our dreams and start taking action and preparing for it today. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Again, those are my links. If you would like to, to send me a message or uh, for a reason or for, any, or for no reason, or just even to say hi, you are always welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. It's, you know, those images are so pretty. We could, we, could, we could keep watching them and talking about them forever. Um, uh, but uh, uh, if you stay... If you stay uh, longer, uh, we'd like to include you in the panel uh, at the end of the event. Thank you so much. Sure, I'll be there. Thank you. Um, now, I would like to bring uh, bring um, uh, um, you know, Professor Anita Sengupta, uh, who is in our department at, at USC, uh, in uh, the uh, School of Engineering. And we go a long ways when she was a student at USC. and. Uh, um, uh, uh, welcome, Anita, uh, to our second edition uh, of the Space Philosophy Gathering. And thank you for having me do. And I've enjoyed listening to the presentations this morning. Um, and I think there's a lot of synergies between our different uh, topics of conversation with regards to sustainability and climate change. And so the title of my talk is a bit of a riff on uh, the sci-fi trilogy, <laughs> Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. But um, uh, during the course of my career, I found that uh, people who work for the space program and how I was trained by the space program really does lead to innovation, which can support uh, sustainable technology developments over time. Um, so I spent most of my career working for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, 16 years on everything from electric propulsion systems, which is my PhD research for the Dawn mission, to uh, the supersonic parachute for the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover, and then a atomic physics uh, facility for the International Space Station. And I think the theme of dare mighty things is very appropriate for what we do in the space program, because basically you turn uh, the seemingly impossible to the possible, and that's how I was trained for the bulk of my career. I left in 20 2017, I got recruited to join uh, Virgin Hyperloop as an executive where we were creating a, a ground-based uh, transportation, which is inspired kind of by the space program. And now I um, 
have my own company, which is in the electric aviation space, specifically in hydrogen powered aviation to help to decarbonize aviation. And, 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 I, must, and I must mention that uh, Anita is in that incredible clip uh, of uh, uh, the seven minutes of terror uh, uh, that, uh, that JPL put together uh, before uh, the Mars Curiosity, the Mars Science Lab landed. And I think it's an incredible, <laughs> incredible uh, video, Anita. I'm so happy that you are in it. Me too. And, and, I, and he, uh, the, per, the producer of the video, John Beck, actually also supports uh, my new company and he helped us create our introductory video for our customer, our first Excellent. government customer. So <laughs> yeah, you got you to gotta keep, uh, keep all those connections going. And I'm also a very active pilot. So during the pandemic, I actually joined the Civil Air Patrol, which um, is a basically search and rescue organization. So um, I'm training to be a search and rescue pilot as well. Excellent. So that's what I do Please, on my, my part time. Um, so I think when we think about the space program, oftentimes um, there is a lot of criticism that comes from the public. Um, and I think it's gotten a lot uh, greater, I don't know why it keeps on changing, it got greater recently because of the space tours that's been going on. And that's been discussed for, I don't know, this past couple of months. Um, and obviously, you know, Prince uh, William also criticized it. Uh, but at the same time, I became an engineer because of the space program. So I've been a science fiction fan my whole life. Um, and I had an opportunity to meet William Shatner recently. Um, I was his guest on his show, which is I don't understand talking about basically how does one get into space? This is before he actually went into space. So that was kind of the irony. And I'm enormous Star Trek fans. So that was really <laughs> highlight for me. Uh, but ultimately, as a science fiction fan, since a small child, I've always wanted to make science fiction a reality. And my favorite quote actually comes from Theodore Verne. Carmen, which is that engineering basically allows you to create the future that you imagine. And so I think we can build a future, a beautiful future, a better future using technology and our expertise as, as space program engineers. And another great quote comes from uh, The Martian, which is a book and a movie, which is basically in the face of overwhelming odds, you can science the shit out of everything. And I think that's true. And I think you see that in the space program time and time again, whether or not you're doing something really crazy, like landing on Mars in a really difficult way, or or you're solving a challenge because something goes wrong when you're in orbit um, or you're on the surface of the moon. Um, but there's also another type of science fiction, which is, is also a good version of science fiction, which is instead of utopian like Star Trek, there's dystopian science fiction. And so this, of course, comes from the most recent Blade Runner movie. And we really do have to think about our um, impact on the environment and how technologies we create have an environmental cost. And this obviously represents a dystopian version of Los Angeles um, in the not so distant future. So we want to kind of avoid that. Um, and you can even take it to the sort of solar system level scale is that if you take a look at the terrestrial planets, um, we can see that climate change happens at the planetary scale. So at the formation of our solar system, Mars, Venus, and Earth were actually a lot more similar to each other in terms of having water on the surface of the planet, um, in terms of having an atmosphere um, which either wasn't too thin or too thick. But now, of course, Venus has experienced a runaway greenhouse gas effect, has a surface temperature of close to 500, centigrade, 500 degrees centigrade, has a surface uh, pressure 100 times that on Earth, and then Mars is the exact opposite with a surface pressure 1% um, and, uh, you, know, um, you know, no appreciable water on the surface. So we can see that climate change can happen at the planetary scale. And one of the justifications for Venus exploration, which has now become a lot more popular uh, this decade coming up with a variety of missions going there, is to understand how those planets evolve. So from a scientific perspective, we can think about sustainability and, and climate change at the planetary scale. But if we look a little bit closer to home, um, um, we can see that, you know, carbon footprint output of every sector is still on the rise. And then when you take a look at the aviation sector versus other forms of transport, other forms of transport are now being decarbonized because they're shifting over to batteries, whereas aviation is actually increasing, um, and especially as a percentage of the pie, because more people are traveling by airplane. So it's something that we have to address. Um, and obviously having emissions at altitude are even worse than having emissions on the ground when it comes to the overall warming effect on the atmosphere. So what do we need to do? We need to reinvent everything. And that's where you know the space program mindset comes in. And my favorite thing, systems engineering. I trained um, as a systems engineer for many years when I was with NASA. Um, if you think about it from, you know, what do we need to do to solve these environmental challenges from a technology perspective? We obviously have to think about any new technology addresses the 
the environmental impact, which means reducing your carbon footprint. We also have to make sure that new technologies are accessible, right? A Tesla for eighty thousand uh, dollars for a person is not a good solution, right? It's got to be something which is affordable, and I hope it actually goes more into the context of you know mass transit as opposed to individual car ownership. And things also have to be safe, right? You're not going to want to get on any new form of transportation which is going to um, endanger people. So that's obviously safety first is definitely part of the space program mindset. And then interoperability is really important. I am a technologist myself. We like to think in a vacuum of how our technology works, but you have to think about how those technologies interface with everything else, whether that's from the energy production side, which very much ties into sustainability, or whether that's from how you go from one form of transport to another form of transport seamlessly and efficiently. And then of, co of course, cost is an incredibly important one. So one of the reasons why you don't see a shift over to electric vehicles, why you don't see a shift over to sustainable aviation fuels is that they're too expensive, either for the individual or for the airline operator. And so cost is key in being able to adopt new sustainability technologies. And so my favorite technology that I like to talk about um, in the context of the space program is the Hyperloop. So the Hyperloop is basically a maglev train, uh, which means that it's electric it's uh, levitating magnetically and it's electrically propelled, which means it can, it's carbon emission free in terms of what it's operating, but it operates inside of a vacuum tube. So the Hyperloop is actually a spacecraft traveling on the ground, ironically. And so that obviously takes its um, sort of mindset from the space program and the white paper back in 2013 from Elon Musk kind of kicked off this whole um, movement towards Hyperloop as a um, new technology. And it's largely um, in the domain of startups right now. So I worked at one Virgin, but there's another one in LA and there's a bunch in Europe and there's a few in India and then two in Canada, for example. Um, now, when we think about transportation though, and we think about making it green, we always talk about electrification, but the electricity has to come from energy, which is also produced in a green way, right? So you have to have energy storage and the energy has to come from a carbon emission free way. So that can either by solar, um, it could be by batteries, which obviously has to be powered by solar or wind, um, or it has to come um, from hydrogen. And even the hydrogen has to be made um, using green energy sources. So once again, my space program uh, mindset is that the most abundant element in the universe is hydrogen. It powers our sun, for example. And of course, hydrogen can also come from water with electrolysis electricity. You can split up water, which is a very abundant um, resource here on Earth, to make hydrogen and oxygen. And so that feeds really nicely forward into a new type of technology, which can support um, ground-based transport, it can support aerial transport, and of course, it can support rocket launches, which is hydrogen. And um, if you compare the energy density of hydrogen to um, basically hydrocarbon fuel, it's far more dense. And we all know this, that's the reason why they use hydrogen and oxygen in rockets. And it can also be converted, instead of using it in an internal combustion sense, it can be used in an electrochemical sense in a hydrogen fuel cell. And the hydrogen fuel cell is perfect for cars, it's perfect perfect for buses, it's perfect for airplanes as well, which is the topic of my company. And once again, we can take inspiration from the space program because proton exchange membrane fuel cells were developed for the space program. They were the energy storage means on board of the space shuttle. Yes, the first reusable launch vehicle was the space shuttle, not the SpaceX one. Um, and, uh, and it worked really well and it's far more efficient than batteries because they weigh a lot less. So for anything for the space program, mass is probably your primary limitation. So a hydrogen fuel cell is actually much better solution for energy storage versus batteries, and that goes for Earth-based applications too. It can also be used for onboard storage for spacecraft, and it could be used for things like Mars airplanes or Mars helicopters or, you know, even Titan rotor craft, which are happening in the near future. Um, and so when I tie that back to what I'm working on now and what I saw to be a primary challenge is the fact that aviation um, isn't being decarbonized from a technology perspective. So my company is actually to develop a hydrogen fuel cell power plant initially for small aircraft, but the technology is modular to support larger aircraft like twin turboprop systems. And, you know, at the end of the day, the goal, of course, is to get to jet aircraft, but that does require uh, modifications to the technology because it has to operate at a different temperature and at higher altitudes. But when we look at space flight as a means of sustainable transportation, we, of course, you can get some negatives when you think about suborbital flight. Is it necessary? But it is hydrogen powered in the context of Blue Origin. And if you can produce that hydrogen using electrolysis, which comes from renewables, as opposed to, um, you know, the reforming process, which is typically used, which is not uh, carbon friendly, um, you can have uh, suborbital travel, which can replace, you know, 
the fact that it doesn't exist, supersonic aircraft, you could have suborbital travel of the means of getting you from point A to point B um, over a short period of time as opposed to going with, you know, like a transatlantic, transoceanic aircraft. And so, you know, uh, launch vehicles developed on hydrogen power are also nothing new. They've been around for many decades. Um, so Delta IV launch vehicle program that I worked on at the very start of my career was liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. And you can see how hydrogen can also power low Earth orbit um, transportation and, of course, beyond the moon and then beyond to interplanetary space. Um, now, a slight different segue but still related to the test, the uh, space program is the growing of food. So for any future explorers to the surface of Mars, they will all be vegetarians because they're not going to be bringing you know, chickens and cattle with them because that's energy inefficient. And so they will be growing their own food, something called extremophiles, using living off the land, those principles that we discussed so much when I took uh, Medu's class, uh, I think it was like 20 years ago, uh, which is in situ resource utilization. And lo and behold, we also have inspiration once again from things that are actively being developed for the International Space Station, the veggie habitat, which grows, grows lettuce on orbit in a microgravity environment. It's actually a lot easier to grow things in a gravity environment, so it'll be easier for people to grow food on the surface of Mars. But I do like the fact that if you are a vegetarian, you actually have a smaller carbon footprint, so you're already doing something to help the environment. So I think that also couples nicely into the space program mindset. And of course, electric vehicles. So electric vehicles were used to transport astronauts um, around on the surface of moon all those decades ago, they'll be used to transport um, people on the surface of Mars, um, you know, hopefully in the next one to two decades. And that feeds really nicely into electric vehicles here on Earth. And of course, this one is something from NASA Johnson, which is being developed for Mars application. But we have um, electric vehicles now are more and more uh, apparent, but we do need slightly different energy storage beyond batteries moving forward. And then, of course, I think the topic that sums it all up when it comes to the sustainability mindset is in situ resource utilization, ISRU. So when we think of the space program, we think of power generation comes from solar panels. We think of radiation protection on the surface of Mars comes from either creating habitats made from Martian um, soil bricks or living under the ground to protect yourself from the you know, galactic cosmic rays. Think of water production, electrolyzing uh, frozen subsurface aquifers that exist on Mars that even exist probably um, on the moon. And then Although not necessarily environmentally friendly, you can produce methane, which is a rocket fuel, but you could also take that water and create rocket fuel for yourself on the surface of Mars. And then extremophiles, which is genetically engineered plants, which produce all, a lot of oxygen, take in the CO2. And you can see how that would also have a carbon reduction potential here on Earth if we design them to suck uh, uh, carbon from the atmosphere uh, to help to decarbonize our own atmosphere here. So there's almost no shortage of examples of ways that the space program can help with that sustainability mindset. And so Way, the way I like to think about it is that we can create green technologies here on Earth to help Earth, but we can also create green technologies to connect the solar system. Because when we go to the surface of Mars, when we go um, to the surface of the moon, as we're already doing in orbit on the International Space Station, you have to be efficient, energy efficient, and you have to reuse everything. So that's why that sustainability mindset has always been the case. So I hope I didn't make it too quick, but I didn't know how long I had. So <laughs> I figured I'd get through it quickly. And if you have any questions, for me. Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, you can certainly send me a tweet on anything you want to know more about. Um, but uh, thank you for having me and happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. Will you stay on or do you, do you have things to do? I've got to leave at one o'clock. <laughs> okay. So nice to have you and uh, uh, to see all the new things you're doing. Uh, and um, uh, well, a Merry Christmas to you if you don't stay on to the panel, but uh, we're going to miss you. Uh, thank you so much again. Take care. Um, we are on to our next speaker. Um, and that is none other than my good friend, uh, Mike Parr, who is a neighbor. Uh, I mean, he keeps a home in different places, but uh, we just had uh, um, a lunch a few days ago. And Mike is back <laughs> in Jackson, uh, Wyoming, after a whirlwind trip or a beautiful tour of the Antarctica, and uh, I asked to, you know, we do discuss um, you know, philosophy of space sometimes. I first met uh, Mike uh, during the first uh, International Space University meeting um, uh, program uh, at, the, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And since then, um, we've been in close contact 
Uh, Mike, um, your uh, the floor is yours, Mike. Well, well, thank you for that, Madhu. Yeah, I just we just figured out the other day that we had known each other for thirty three years. It's been a it's been a delightful thirty three <laughs> years, Madhu. That was a time <laughs> when all of us had hair, right, Mike? <laughs> and uh, one of my first bosses 32 years ago was Stephen Durst. So it's nice that we had on, on the same the same phone call, the same panel. Yes. Yeah. So um, yeah, I want to talk about grand space strategy and accelerating humanity. Uh, humanity as a multiplanetary species. You know, and the first thing you know, th this has been a, a really fun panel to be uh, discussing philosophy in space and Madhu. You know, Nicole was so kind at the beginning of the panel when she kicked off and she talked, she gave the summary from the last session that was written and it almost sounded like a poetic manifesto in the way that you summarized the, the previous panel. And you know, the, the reality is that these subjects, when you have a panel like this, in some ways are really messy. And the reason why it's messy is because there's no leadership in space and there's no strategy in space. And so, and because of that, you get uh, the, the beautiful chaos that we have on this panel uh, today, right? So one of the things that's, uh, you know, exciting about this panel is extremely uh, multidisciplinary. And, you know, multidisciplinary is an essential aspect of trying to solve humanity's greatest challenges. And the one thing that we have to be honest about is that most of the challenges that we confront with space really don't have anything at all to do with technology. The, challenge, the, the, the fundamental challenges that we have with space are leadership, strategy, politics, and funding. And the, the technology will take care of itself. That, 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 that's, that's gonna be sorted out. And I think that's really the, um, you know, the theme of, of, of my presentation. So in some ways, we almost have to look at, you know, discussions of philosophy is almost like kind of a value chain pyramid, you know, and, and, and we have to think about what level we come at, we, we, we uh, are discussing in that pyramid, you know, it could be infrastructure, it could be human nature, it could be utopia, there's all sorts of elements that we can be uh, speaking about. And so my, 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 the area that I'm talking about is, you know, somewhere, somewhere on that spectrum. Uh, and I'm really more interested in, in kind of the human condition, uh, you know, uh, trying to understand, uh, you know, uh, you know, human, human emotion as it relates to politics. And politics is interesting, right? Because in some ways, you know, politics has been defined as the art of the possible. But also when it comes to large projects, it's really about the art of the impossible. And one of the things that always captured my imagination was the great quote by, uh, by uh, uh, Werner, uh, uh, I'm blanking on his name, but um, anyways, the, the, the great quote that, uh, we, the, that uh, Humanity can, uh, you know, we, we can we can defeat gravity, but we probably can't defeat bureaucracy. And that really is that's one of the that's one of the uh, the, the you know the, the great challenges. I think you know one of my favorite quotes that probably relates to uh, to the endeavor of space is really the quote by uh, Charlie Munger, who argues if you want to understand behavior, you have to understand incentives. So when you look at dysfunctional politics and dysfunctional space agencies, you really have to understand incentives. And, and then all of a sudden there's a clarity to the chaos that, uh, that we have. And uh, you know, um, several years ago, I did a deep dive into the strategies of almost every major spacefaring nation. And I was stunned, not one of them, not one of them has defined making humanity as a multi-planetary species as a part of their space strategy. And I think, you know, and, and, and most of these uh, strategies of space agencies are pretty uh, uninspiring. I mean, even look at the Russian uh, strategy. You know, the Russians in their soul, they love space. They, you know, as a people, they love space. If you look at their space strategy, a big part of it is all about acquisition and procurement. And it's the same thing with NASA, you know, a, a, a really, powerful and effective space strategy should probably be 10 pages. NASA's space strategy is 85 pages. 
And if you have an 85 page strategy document, you're setting yourself up uh, for pain. And, um, you know, and so, so, so th th that's where I would uh, kind of kick off some of the thinking. So, the, you know, there's a, and here's just a collection, you know, here we are, we're approaching uh, 2022. We're trying to kind of reorient ourselves and to reframe uh, the way we look at space issues. And I just threw up uh, a collection of uh, interesting milestones. And th this is this is pretty random set of milestones. It could be a whole lot of other ones. But, you know, the Wright brothers 118 years ago, that's, you know, it's an interesting data point. Moon landing 52 years ago. The Mir deorbit 20 years ago, as some of you might know uh, who, who are on this, uh, this, this video conference, uh, you know, I was involved with uh, putting together the film Orphans of Apollo, which talked about the commercialization of the Mir space station and tremendous amount of lessons related to uh, Mir, a fantastic, uh, you know, inspiration. And, and many people uh, really feel like that kicked off the new space revolution, which thank God is driving uh, a lot of the progress that we have today. I mean, one of the things that you don't have to go that many years back to think about when Elon first started his project, he wasn't welcomed in the space industry. He wasn't welcomed by NASA. He wasn't welcomed by the world. He wasn't uh, welcomed by other people in the aerospace industry. And it wasn't until NASA shut down the space shuttle program and, uh, and, the, and then Kennedy Space Flight Center was basically, looked like it, it looked like nothing was gonna be happening there. And when Elon started launching out of uh, Kennedy Space Flight Center, it was like a, a button had been pushed. There was this immediate love and acceptance of Elon, but no thanks to strategy, no thanks to politics, no thanks to people in the field. And, uh, you know, and here it is. Uh, now Elon's been, uh, you know, uh, named ten, uh, Time Magazine Man of the Year. You know, it was... Um, it was a it was a painful period for Elon with you know with a number of the setbacks he had early on, but one of the things that I find um, you know ironic is that uh, people, uh, including Ariana Spass, uh, laughed in his face, saying you know you're an idiot, you don't know what you're doing, uh, we're experts, we've been doing this for a long time, and literally <laughs> Ariana Spass has had to lay off thousands of people and re uh, think about how they uh, approach. Um, uh, you know, rocketry. You know, the other thing that uh, while the United States has made some progress in terms of commercial space or new space, um, you know, it was not so long ago, I was on a panel in Europe and um, a European um, representatives of the European Space Agency, you know, argued in my face that, uh, you know, Europe was doing fantastic when it came to commercialization. You know, they had these big, you know, what I'd call corporate welfare programs, shoveling money in for jobs, which have nothing to do with making uh, humanity a multi-planetary species. You know, and then the, the other interesting milestone that was just announced was that China wants a human presence on the moon in 2026. And so if, if institutionally, if, the, if space agencies around the world can't get their act together, uh, and, and if China is able to execute and do what they, what they say they're gonna do, um, that, may be, that may be the disruptor that ends all the silliness of corporate welfare and get people focused on making humanity a multi-planetary species. You know, there's this great quote, and I know Madhu's heard it a lot, but you know, no bucks, no buck Rogers. So, you know, it's a simplistic argument about, you know, whether we're successful or unsuccessful in space. But, you know, it's interesting because money is not, um, is not everything when it comes to space. And a big, you know, so I would say that strategy is probably central and then efficiency. So you want efficiency. And of course you want the money to support the strategy and the efficiency and the sustainability. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, going back to the Mir space station, I mean, that was certainly a creature of the cold war. And, uh, you know, some people argue that we may be in a, a in a new cold war and, uh, you know, and, and so, some of the lessons that came out of it, both uh, on the you know the Soviet side and on the American side, was that yeah you could you could race to get to the moon, but uh, but if you didn't do it properly, if you didn't do it sustainably, uh, it was just basically a public relations stunt and it was a political stunt, and so the you know the big question is 
trying to learn the lessons uh, from, from that era. And it's interesting, right? Because if you think about like, you know, the Vietnam War, there were a lot of uh, lessons and sometimes those lessons were learned and sometimes they were not uh, learned and Afghanistan is kind of a case in point. So the question is, you know, for, for policymakers and uh, folks in the community is that, you know, we have to uh, learn, learn these lessons about sustainability and uh, efficiency. You know, and one of the things that I think uh, Madhu will talk about uh, later, uh, you know, as he wraps up this panel, is kind of the importance of biology and, you, and, and, and also the inspiration of biology. And one of the things that I would uh, argue is that, uh, you know, human uh, presence and, and, and becoming a multi-planetary species is uh, essential. But the, 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 uh, the visual, practical, high impact step before going there is putting a lot of robots to work, building a lot of different things and almost uh, taking on a biological ecosystem uh, type, type of approach. And one of the things about um, the, uh, you know, about kind of the transhumanist movement, which is something that, you know, we've seen really take off in the last decade, you know, they talk about, you know, the augmentation extension of the human condition. And that was something that one of the other panelists uh, brought up. But, you know, this kind of biological robotic, uh, you know, uh, export uh, to, to various planets and, and, and also to, to space colonies is part, in some ways can, can almost be viewed uh, as being inspired by transhumanism. And then, you know, when, when we look at uh, becoming a multi-planetary species, one of the things we have to look at is trying to change our mindset from a mindset of scarcity to a mindset of abundance. And, and one of the things that comes out of abundance thinking is what do you do when you ha have abundance? How does that change strategy? How does that change uh, tactics on the ground, uh, you know, in, in terms of the space movement? And I think that, um, you know, we have, I, th I think a lot of the, uh, the old government contracting mentality, the scarcity mentality, the nation state mentality of big corporate welfare is scarcity. It's a scarcity mindset. And, um, you know, and, and it doesn't serve the people in the short term. Uh, politicians think they're delivering a service to these uh, companies that are trying to uh, suck money from uh, from governments. But long term, it doesn't create that uh, sustainability and abundance mindset. And um, the next uh, slide. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting because if you look at, uh, you know, we're, we're particularly where the United States uh, has been or where, uh, or, or, you know, maybe even where the, the, uh, the world has been in terms of space, you know, you just have to ask yourselves a few fundamental questions. And there's a lot more, there's probably better questions than this, right? Because I just, you know, I, I just wanted something to, to be able to show people. But, you know, for, for, for many years after, they, after the U.S. shut down the space shuttle program, there was no manned, no, no U.S. manned uh, rated rocket to get uh, astronauts to, to uh, space. And that was only through the Russian Uber experiment. And, and so, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, why would a, a country that markets itself as a leader in the space area, why would they be without a man rated rocket for years and years and years? You know, and that's due to incompetence and dysfunction. And you know, and, and now we've had this 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 issue, this question about when do we deorbit the uh, ISS, which has been over a hundred billion dollar experiment. And you know, the latest the latest argument is that we get rid of that lab in 2030, which is you know it's a hundred billion dollar uh, experiment. But um, you know, the question is, is that the best use of money? Are there ways to deal with that? Should it be privatized? How should it be privatized? And then there's the final question, why, why humanity is not on the moon and why it takes more than 10 years to return to the moon. Again, these are not technical issues. These are, these are fundamentally about, um, about, you know, about politics. You know, Madhu and I uh, had the pleasure of meeting at the uh, inaugural session of the International uh, Space University. And it's funny because when you have a classroom filled with engineers, but one thing they don't want to hear is the uh, axiom that politics always wins. And so 
that the, the so and particularly in the United States context, but it could be applied to many countries. Uh, politics is the death of grand strategy as we know it, and so it's just that simple. If you if, you know, and and if you if you want to transform leadership and you want to transform uh, uh, strategy, you've got to also uh, dig into the politics. And, and, and so one of the things you need to do is, I think, you know, if you want to be subversive about it, is actually have a, an effective, powerful strategy, effective leadership, and then start to chip away at some of the dysfunction uh, in, uh, in politics. You know, and, and, and I think uh, throughout the years, uh, most space agencies, but NASA's no exception, you know, there's always these wish lists of things that they want to do, but wish list is not a strategy. And if you look at the, the thousands of activities that NASA is involved with, which is, you know, education at K through 12 and publicity and, you know, all sorts of things. NASA is involved with hundreds and, you know, and, and thousands and thousands of things. They ought to be involved with one or two things. And one of that's multiplanetary species. And of course, the other one, which is uh, kind of an embarrassment, is, you know, NASA, you know, there's a big question about who's responsible for uh, you know, if if there's going to be a, a planetary scenario where we could hit, be hit by an asteroid or a meteorite, and it's not really clear who's in charge of that, but oftentimes, oftentimes when there's a near-Earth object, you'll hear uh, NASA PR people on the news saying, hey, just relax, we've got everything under control, and, you know, it's, it's obvious that that's not, that's not the answer, and uh, if NASA was honest and said, hey, we need more resources to really treat this properly and to be proper guardians. I mean, it's uh, literally every six months, amateurs find near Earth objects that have never been seen by NASA. And so it's not appropriate to say everything's under control when NASA has no clue where many of these near Earth uh, objects uh, are coming in from. So uh, I think you can take, you can try to deal with um, grand national space strategy from two areas from above and below. I think that uh, it really will take this kind of this uh, existential challenge uh, politically, so, uh, perhaps China in 20, uh, 2026, uh, to really put pressure uh, on many countries. Uh, and then, you know, I would, I would love to see a realignment commission to try to rationalize um, a lot of these NASA space centers. I mean, does it make sense that Houston is the center for human spaceflight? Uh, in, a, in an era where you have, uh, you know, uh, SpaceX and others, and I, and I think it's hard, it's hard to argue that, but you need to create a political uh, a mechanism that allows that to be rationalized. And uh, I would just, in conclusion, argue for the rebirth of grand strategy. Uh, I would, uh, and, 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 and the key part of that is a scalable, sustainable, uh, push to to make humanity a multiplanetary species. Uh, it's just absolutely insane that that's not part of any strategy of any space agency on Earth. And uh, planetary pr protection. And if NASA can't do those sort of things, it really is an adapt or perish. And uh, you know, and we we talked about you know, there's been a lot of uh, you know discussion uh, today about uh, you know tourism and space tourism, whether it's good or bad. And I just wanted to you know just to kind of. Uh, make a final little comment, which was I, I noticed last week that the FAA said they're no longer going to be issuing astronaut wings. But it was just such an irony that uh, a bureaucratic organization like FAA uh, put their their boot on the neck of Wally Funk, an 82 year old uh, woman who is a space pioneer and, and refused to give her her astronaut wings. And that's exactly the sort of mentality that we have to bust up through grand strategy and not through minutia of bureaucratic infighting and bureaucratic silliness. I rest my case. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sage advice, Mike. You know, we've been at this for long enough to know how um, large agencies operate and um, you wish it were otherwise. And so we expect people like you and Elon and others to just uh, just uh, take it on yourselves to, to make it happen. And, uh, you know, the agency has reasons to, to uh, what we would call um, to um, exist. And uh, in all agencies, you find this as, 
as organizations grow large, they have a baggage of bureaucracy and uh, a legacy, and uh, it interferes with, uh, with progress. And, uh, and yet, and yet, NASA is the finest governmental agency, and uh, if not in the United States, but on our planet. So, so you know, I like to think that chaos and confusion uh, is an important ingredient of, uh, of life and living. And then uh, like Obama, I think it was Obama who said that uh, playing politics is just like football. <laughs> once, once in a while you see a window and you make a pass. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, it's a shame that is that way right now. Elon is struggling very hard to get Starship going. I happen to be with the turbine, um, um, the, 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 well, I shouldn't be saying this, but anyway, uh, we were talking about, <laughs> about the problems with the Raptor. And he said, you know, it, it happens in architecture all the time. When, um, when you have a vision and uh, your uh, engineering support is not capable or able to do it, you always go for a new engineer. I mean, it's that simple. And and Elon is notorious for cleaning house every now and then to get his project going. And uh, oh, there are a lot, so many dead bodies. But uh, the, the, um, you know, uh, there are some good things also because we have all of us. We have friends at NASA, and we know the struggles they go through. Thank you so much. Now um, we are off to uh, our uh, next speaker, and that is uh, and that is none other than Phnom <clears throat> Phnom Bagley. Do I say your name right, Phnom? It's a beautiful name. I sometimes wonder if I'm I'm really uh, butchering it. <laughs> no problem. It's pronounced phenom, like phenomenon. But phenomenon. Okay, phenom. Phenom. Okay. So good to have you. Uh, phenom is a um, is a graduate of the world famous Sasakawa Institute of Space Architecture at the uh, University of Houston, and uh, uh, she is she her, her runs. Uh, her company, Nonfiction LLC. And uh, we are so uh, happy that you are able to um, spend some time with us now. Thank you, Madhu. Thank you, Madhu. And thank you everyone who's organizing this amazing lineup of speakers on, a, on such a s important subjects, uh, space philosophy and a place in it. So today I wanted to talk about imperfect astronauts. Typically, these two words never go together. We always look at astronauts as these superhero, superhuman types of individuals. And as we travel in the future, we, we need to in, include more and more people. And um, as the numbers are growing, we have to include people who are not necessarily quote unquote perfect on paper. So this is what the talk today is going to be about. So a little bit of background about what I do. So I, um, I run a company that turns science fiction into reality for the better future. And we do that in space as well as on earth by developing many types of technologies, um, mostly for the first time. So this presentation is gonna be cut in three parts. The first part is going to be about the right stuff. It's an expression uh, that's been used for, for many decades now to describe um, you know, these superhumans I've been talking about. So when we think about the early humans in space, like here, Yuri Gagarin getting ready to, to go to space as the first human up there, um, it was about survival above all else, right? Comfort, what he really thought, thought about it, you know, like all the details of, 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 uh, of, of how it feel to be up there were like very secondary to the engineering, you know, the, the STEM, um, uh, disciplines that would get him up there and get, if, uh, get him back safe, safely on Earth. When we think about the right stuff, we also think about uh, engineering predictable humans. 
uh, again, another expression that of wars that should not really go together, right? Humans are can be predictable in some ways, but for the most part are not. But really putting uh, humans together in a mission that is quite dangerous um, uh, for their survival, but, but also for, for the mission itself is, is, is something that, uh, you know, we, we need to mitigate all the risks as much as possible to make sure that the mission is successful. So for a long time, what we did was fitting humans in available technology in the 1950s, 1960s, whatever technology was available, we, we, we try to include it in there, whether it's physical technology, engineering, um, you know, communication or whatever. Uh, and we're still doing the same. The latest and greatest is what we're trying to put in there. But how do we think ahead and make uh, this environment that we create for humans a lot more supportive of who they are? So the second part of this presentation is going to be about diversity, equity, inclusion in space. So I believe, and I'm not the only one, that um, the, the future is going to include a lot more of us, not these quote unquote perfect humans, right? Here you can see uh, Professor Stephen Hawking uh, in his later years, um, enjoying uh, kind of like a microgravity environment, artificial one in a, in a parabolic flight. Um, so he's not a representation of the right stuff, but he's still human and he's very, very much close to us in many ways. And we have to think about this uh, of the same thing of children, right? Space right now is not designed for children, but we we'll have to think in the future that they will be included. Not only children from uh, space countries or, or the countries that have prominent space agencies, but also uh, countries uh, all over the world, anybody who grow up, grows up in any country should have the opportunity to dream of being in space in the future. People who have missing limbs or different types of disabilities, physical, mental, or otherwise. People who are pregnant, right? Right now, we don't really think about having babies and, and re reproducing in space because it's so far out. But at some point, if we want to become an interplanetary species, we have to think about this. So how do we support all of this? People of different sizes. You may recall a few years ago when um, you know a, a spacewalk had to be canceled because um, the the space didn't fit uh, the astronauts uh, that that were supposed to go out there. So what happens when humans come in different shapes, size, and forms? Culturally as well, you know, different different cultures see the sky, um, space differently. How, how do they want to relate to being in space or being invited in space uh, based on how they live today on earth? So, so as we're transitioning from the right stuff, uh, the right stuff back, as we defined it back in the 60s to, uh, to including a bunch of people today, um, you know, the, maybe we have to re redefine what the right stuff is. So I actually just went through a, um, an eight week uh, uh, workshop with Loretta Whiteside, which a lot of you might might know about how to, um, you know, kind of like transform the way you think about your own life so you can see yourself um, in space in the future, perhaps, or use the context of space to transform yourself from the inside out. So what I what I really believe as a designer, as, as a space architect, is that imperfection accelerates innovation. Imperfection is really about looking at all the edge cases of how human behavior uh, happens in different uh, environments, and really tackling so uh, tackling these problems and offering solutions for each of us. The way we do it is that uh, we don't only um, tackle STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, math. This has been working for, for the survival part of space missions. Now we want to, for people to live and to thrive up there. And in order to get there, we need to think about other aspects of, of innovation. Science uh, still is still here and we love it because it validates magic. Technology is wonderful because it creates possibilities. Art, right, is, is very secondary or tertiary in a lot of uh, space discussions, but we believe that if it triggers emotion, um, it, it can get us to, to, to higher places. Design, in my mind, is a lot more than making things pretty. It's here to foster connections between all of these disciplines. And of course, business, uh, you know, without money, without um, uh, an investment in time and, and people, we cannot do anything. So business enables change. 
So here I'm going to give a, a few examples of the, some of the work that we've done uh, on Earth and, and in space to, to really illustrate how we can do that. So I believe that um, you know, we have to design for all. And, and to do that, we have to design uh, for each of us. And each of us are different individuals. We all have needs. We all eat differently. We sleep differently. We practice differently. We work differently. And we can use technology to help us um, get to the point where, where, where we're effective in extreme environments. So this product is a, is a brain stimulator that stimulates the primary motor cortex. And it helps us learn movement faster. So when you think of going to space, right, you probably have to train to do everything from opening a door to sleeping properly to, to, to eating uh, in, in microgravity. Um, but there are certain things that you will have to learn very quickly because you have to adapt to different situations in space. So this uh, brain stimulator actually helps you physically adapt quickly. You can learn movement faster. You can learn to, 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 uh, to, to apply, you know, um, to, 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 to learn to, to, to move things, your body, your fingers, uh, and, and align what's going on with your brain, with your body a lot faster. You can do the same with sleep as well. So this, this product helps read the brain at night and stimulate it the next night so you get a higher quality deep sleep, right? Um, so uh, for example, a body ISS, you have to experience 16 uh, sunrises and sunsets a day that really um, um, you know, messes up your circadian rhythm. So using technology of this kind can help support health because without good sleep, we cannot be good uh, workers during the day. Um, and, and also you know, make sure that your mental health throughout the mission is, is optimal. For people with disabilities, you know, um, integrating technology that's ubiquitous and, and can, can be used whenever they need. So here's a product that was developed for people suffering from essential tremors and Parkinson's disease. So you put it on your wrist and it uh, disrupts the feedback loop that's happening between your brain and your wrist. So you can control your hands again, right? And that can be done with any, uh, many parts of the body. Uh, visualization is very important as well in space, right? You, you basically see what's near you. You see planet Earth is you're on orbit and then you see the infinity of space. So when you go to Mars and you're, you're exploring like new places, uh, visibility is going to be great. So using technology like AR uh, uh, on, on your eye, uh, thermal cameras, you know, to see the edges of everything can help you um, um, really um, know where you are and, and not get into dangerous situations just because visibility was, was low. Another thing that's very important is mental health. So here we've been working with uh, doctors developing VR environments to support psychedelic um, trips, basically. So this is used for uh, people suffering from clinical depression, PTSD, and anxiety. So with only six one-hour sessions uh, using ketamine, um, plus VR, plus aromatherapy, plus uh, many sensory um, inputs, um, people have, have gone from a, a suicidal state to, to a state of health. So, so, you know, because astronauts in the future are going to experience long periods of isolation, stress, uh, exposure to radiation, exposure to danger, um, and, and really seeing the same five, five or six people for, for two and a half, three years, right? That, that has an impact on you. How can you, um, you know, uh, change the way your brain functions so you can get back to a healthy state and, um, and, um, uh, and, and, and get back on track. So finally, the, the last part of my presentation is about you know, how we think about the future. What, what I believe is that we need to create systems, environments, and products that support human autonomy in space. So it's easy to think that people who are going to train to go to Mars are going to be you know, the best of the best and they're going to be very predictable, but people are different and people will change. The person who leaves planet Earth to go to Mars is going to be the last, uh, not the same person who arrives on Mars. Just think of ourselves in the last you know, couple of years, we have changed so much being isolated, um, you know, uh, finding different ways to work and communicate with each other. The same thing is going to happen to these people who are going to be, go, be, go to the frontier of where humans have been. And so uh, we need to design for that, right? 
So uh, what I propose here is uh, to kind of like take pre predictability and then move on to adaptability. You know, we cannot try to solve every single problems ahead of a mission, thinking that these are these are the only solutions that are going to be needed. We create to, need to create systems that actually support adaptability. If I need something, I need the tools uh, available to to give me the solution for that. You know, the things that come to mind are like three D printing. Uh, you know, growing the food that you need instead of like shipping everything ahead of time. Uh, things things of the sort. So when we think of food, for example, um, you know, for when you look at um, uh, the ISS, for, for the most part, you know, what they eat is pre-packaged um, food. You know, they open it, they heat it up, they add some water, and uh, and and they start eating. Only uh, every once in a while they get access to free uh, to fresh food. But if you create um, a a kitchen system in microgravity in this environment where you can grow the food. Um, like, like here you can see microalgae bioreactor that uh, gives you access to nutritious food. And then you get to um, um, transform that food into very appetizing um, you know, flavors and colors and textures and in, in, including some culture into that food um, and pleasure. Um, you can actually, you know, um, uh, make make the whole experience a lot more pleasurable for everyone. You know the textures that that really connect us to to the food that we love uh, should be accessible out there. You know even like grilling in space is not something we think about because open open flames are not are not really a good thing in a you know oxygen rich environment uh, in microgravity. So using lasers and and technology of the sort can help us reconnect with who we are as humans. And um, you know, fostering abundance in space through sustainable system is so incredibly important. You know, a lot of the survival, uh, physical needs, and, and psychological needs, we we shouldn't think about this every day. We should think about self-actualization. So when we live in sustainable systems that are abundant, resilient, interconnected, redundant, regenerative, ad adapt adaptable, um, we we are finally able to create. Um, an environment that that um, supports humans, so they can actually do the work that they, they they need to do, and and thrive along the way. So yeah, in conclusion, uh, you know, uh, I believe that we cannot become a thriving interplanetary species without including all of our human imperfections. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Phnom. You know, um, what I find most interesting is. As talks follow one after the other, the web of interconnection is is quite quite fascinating. The terms we use are are similar. Um, the philosophy, if you want to call it that, are common, and uh, and yet there is a lot of diversity in the thought. You know, um, Mike may call it chaos. I mean, many of us will including some Nobel laureates who think uh, chaos is part of, uh, uh, part of life and living. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so happy to see those beautiful slides. Um, can't thank you enough, but will you stay on for, uh, for the uh, panel? Yes, I will. Thank you for the invitation. Will you, will you stay on for the panel uh, for now? Yes, I will. Oh, good. Yeah, I'll see you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much. And now um, uh, we are uh, going to Ken. Who is who is in line next? Is Laura did Laura calling? Ken. So now you know in my schedule, uh, Laura Danley, Doctor Danley, is supposed to talk to us. Um, she is the uh, Laura. Laura tried but was not able to dial in. I'll send you. I sent her the correct information. Okay. Uh, she hasn't been responding. Okay. Yeah. And let me let me tell you what uh, what Laura um, has been doing. Uh, this morning, she took off on a car drive from um, uh, uh, from LA to Oregon to be with her sister. And uh, Laura looked at our outline, and she said, "This is right on target for what she does. She's an observational astronomer." Um, but uh, she 
realizes the importance of uh, knowing our place in the cosmos. And um, she wanted to uh, express her views uh, beyond the scientific dogma and uh, um, uh, into the uh, into the arena that she is also involved in, like uh, um, uh, like uh, Kaya is uh, in preservation of history, in education of um, uh, of uh, of these subjects, and um, also her mentor, uh, who was the uh, uh, who is retired as the curator of Griffith Observatory, um, Ed Krupp lives here. And uh, uh, Ed's area of work uh, is also a, a very interesting one called RKO astronomy. I don't know if, uh, um, if um, Alice has uh, read his works, but he has gone around the world uh, looking at uh, various observatories of the past, starting from Stonehenge. And uh, uh, I was hoping that Ed would come on, but uh, uh, he, he is, uh, <laughs> it's a very interesting term, this retirement term. When people say they retire, uh, they are more busy than ever. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm sure we'll get him in, at, 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 at um, another uh, edition. So um, if Laura is, uh, so Laura is traveling and she's on a ride, she's driving. And she said she's going to call in when she gets to an appropriate place because she does not want to miss this opportunity. So um, we'll stay uh, tuned uh, to get a note from Laura and uh, she may come in. And if she, if the, if she does not, uh, we'll uh, have her in the next edition. Um, so what we can do, Ken, is move on to our next speaker. And that is none other than our dear uh, Professor uh, Fiorella Terence, Fio, we call her Fio. Now, I've known Fio a long time, since the time uh, she was uh, studying and working uh, in San Diego. And uh, uh, then I think we met her at the National Space um, Development Conference, I, it's like that. and. Uh, since then, she has moved on, but but her heart is still in the emotional aspects of what we do. You know, all of us get trained uh, in in the sciences and the engineering disciplines, but but deep, deep, deep within us all is this emotional connection to the things we do, and uh, this could not be truer for Fio because she is the one who first. The, you know, we had heard about the music of the spheres and so on from the composers and so on, but then I had not heard pieces um, translated into music until um, Fio surprised us all uh, with her uh, works. I'm so happy to have her here smiling at us. She, she went through some very traumatic experiences in Florida as well and was on CNN the other day. Uh, because that surfside um, uh, um, collapse of that structure was right next door to her. And uh, the company who built those, uh, the contractors who built all those uh, places, they're, they're the same people. So everybody is now scared about, uh, about this, uh, all this that's going on. Uh, Fio, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Please, please continue. Thank you, Madhu. What a pleasure to see you again and to be part of this event. Can you hear me well? We can hear you well. Yeah, I changed my background uh, to remind you all the work in acoustic astronomy turning into sound or radiation from space. And in this background, you can see the celestial object, uh, you know, the variety of okay. celestial object we have available that we can uh, hear the sound, uh, right? Even uh, from uh, Jupiter moons, so the universe has a lot to say. So let me share what I have prepared for you today. So I, I teach astronomy and physics at the Florida International University in Miami. And, um, you know, I'm an astrophysicist uh, and I take the universe uh, really personally. 
means that when I look at the universe and all the great discovery of astronomy and space exploration and space commercial relation, I see objective data, but I also see laws, uh, principles that apply to life and the universe. So I often wonder if uh, the world of astrophysics uh, could have some lesson, some good commonality that could teach me something about my life. I know it takes a lot of thinking and reaching out to 180 million light years away to find these laws that applies also to my life, these data that apply to my life. I know what you're thinking, oh, she's talking about astrology, not the case. I'm not talking about a magical wisdom, not at all. I'm talking about law of physics. Those law that guide the movement, the trajectory and expansion of all the celestial bodies in the universe itself. So those law is what I call them principia universali, universal principle. Now, you may be wondering why this journey of uh, self-exploration looking up to the universe? Well, we have to go back a long time ago because of the notion that the sky can teach us something about our life is an old idea. You probably remember the Greek, right? They got a very important uh, life lesson, even using simple element, water, air, fire. Now we have a potent, very powerful radio telescope, yet our ability to connect with the universe, to find this principle has contracted. No one is no longer talking what the universe can teach us, what the universe has to say. This is a universe that wants to talk, right? So. I ask myself, uh, what are these principles that I can use, uh, I can derive from this objective data, and this uh, principle can apply to my life? Well, I was able to find uh, six of them, but the reason was uh, that I was uh, seeking for principle that do not discriminate uh, between uh, the enormous and the tiny or the primitive or new. So the principle I distilled simply are, they work in the universe, they work in my life. And these are, uh, according to my research, unchangeable universal law. And uh, we can try to change it, but we can only break ourselves against them. Okay, so I only was able to distill six of them. I'm still refining, so I'm presenting this uh, uh, first attempt. My principia number one, my principle number one is that uh, it appears to me the universe is a self-referral. It contains everything. It contains every law. It contains every action. It feels that this universe knows what to do, right? There is a star that evolves. There are a season on this planet. So it's also self-updating this universe. It refers to itself because so far we haven't found another parallel universe that maybe is a reflection. So this self-referral principle, I use it every day. And I ask myself, do I have all it takes? And the answer, is that yes, I do have everything within myself. So since I take the universe personally, I try to imitate that. And I found it very useful because if I refer to what I have within myself, I am also actually 
more productive instead of spinning out in 3000 direction asking for help delegating some someone else so the self referral principle the second one is that everything in the universe it's really dynamic exchange is a changing it is a recycling is a star that explode it's nothing is static a black hole a neutron star a pulsar everything is a transforming everything is a flowing this is an evolution something is moving in some direction so i apply this principle number two of dynamic exchange to my life and um, even when i teach every semester i refine readjust uh, i change my style because i want to imitate this principle of dynamic exchange even with my student learning so i can get better i know it takes a lot of work i know it's not easy but uh, stagnation being static uh, i believe is not gonna lead uh, anywhere my favorite example my favorite principle do you notice a maximization a maximization of good coincidence in the universe don't you see that the atoms hydrogen atoms are able to come together to form a star right imagine you as a coincidence, a maximization of a coincidence, one eggs, billions of spermatozoa, maximization of coincidence, and there you are. So this is my favorite. I always think about that the universe could have been a constructor not to maximize good coincidences, but actually to do the opposite avoid coincidences yet that is not the case so this is an important again is my favorite and i try to explain how the universe maximize a good coincidence how does it do it the answer as of today is that it uses a combination and permutation so I try to think about the maximization of good coincidences in my life. And Madhu, meeting you is a coincidence and we are maximizing on this coincidence. That, so, that, that, is, that is so kind of you to say, uh, Theo. And when we look at our lives, when we look at our lives, just look back on yesterday and the day before and see how many things we maximized because of things that happened around us that we did not know was going to happen. True, absolutely. And it's a being part of these cosmic games. Being able to show up today on Zoom is another maximization of coincidence because we don't know what it may turn into. So we need to take advantage of this important um, law, this important principle, right? And uh, I'm looking for all other words, maybe coincidences uh, is not uh, the right word, uh, but there is uh, something, there is a force that is uh, pushing things to happen, atoms to come together, start to be formed. And that's principle number three. Hello, number four is the principle of relevant individuality. Because when you look up to the universe, uh, the variety, the beauty of this variety is awesome. Not one object is similar to the other one. The more we look, the more variety we are going to find. And this individuality is what makes the celestial object relevant in the universe. 
is not the being similar to another star, is not the being similar to another object or to another person uh, that uh, makes you relevant, uh, makes you important, uh, makes you having a role in the universe. Even if we don't understand what is uh, the role, but this is what I see through my telescope. Uh, a huge variety from black hole to supernova, and everything is individual and it's relevant in its own phenomena. We need to apply this, this principle to our life, really celebrate individuality instead of repressing it, celebrate originality, celebrate non-stereotype, right? Break away from stereotype, that's when we become relevant. Right? Think about my life, right? I've been fighting the scientist stereotype all my life, right? If I am a serious scientist, I should not have long hair. But wait a second, the serious scientists have a different hair color. I'm all wrong. My torso is wrong for being an astrophysicist. My lips are wrong for being an astrophysicist. I mean, Madhu, it feels like I didn't get it right whatsoever. In order to be accepted as a relevant astrophysicist, I had to fit into a stereotype, which I never did. I actually went the opposite way I went into the less travel road because I am who I am. This is my relevant individuality and I'm not going to change it because someone told me cut your hair or don't talk about the music during astronomy or don't talk about the poetry or don't talk about the philosophy because you're not an astrophysicist. I can do both. We can do both. We can unite reason and imagination. Yes, if someone out there is wondering, can I be an engineer and an actor? Can I be a top model and a biologist? Absolutely, go for relevant individuality. And we get to uh, the principia number five is uncertainty. Right, uh, we, we know uh, that you know, even in an atom, when we look, uh, it's impossible to find the position of this electron because how fast it's moving. So there is always an uncertainty. I fight it all my life. Uh, I was very uncomfortable with the variable, with uncertainty in my life. Uh, yet it was by looking at the universe, uh, that I became more comfortable in this uncertainty. I don't know if I'm gonna be here tomorrow. I don't know what's gonna happen to me when I drive or when I turn on uh, my gas stove. So welcome uncertainty. Welcome, give me ideas, challenge me to think about, uh, challenge me to think about the risk and the benefit, welcome uncertainty, because you make me look for more law to understand the hydrogen atom or to understand what's inside a black hole. And the last principia is again infinite transformation, which goes back a little bit to the principle uh, I discussed uh, before. Last, and again, I, I am up only to six. I wanted to push to seven, but I couldn't make it. So <laughs> I know seven, the beautiful number, the musical notes, the seven day of the weeks, uh, Deepak Chopra, seven law of success. <laughs> I couldn't make it. So here's the principle of quantum dynamics. So it's really a quantum uh, um, reality, right? What we live is a quantum universe. It's not as continuous as we would like to be. Do you notice when you drive on freeway that there are quantum 
of cars grouped together, right? And you have to sneak out, uh, go in the fast lane or sneak out so you can go into the next quantum. So it's a quantum. It goes really in big jump, this life. In, in, the, in, in transportation engineering, we call it pulsing. <laughs> pulsing, I love it. Absolutely, pulsing. So there is a, this a quantum structure of our life, right? Everything appears continuous to our eyes, but it's not. And so it's a universe that really flicker in and out. As an astrophysicist, I was trained to focus when the universe is materializing itself, it flickers into existence. Now I have a 3000 picture of a neutron star and a black hole. But what is behind that? Right? That my quantum dynamic leap into past what I see, right? This dark matter, this dark force or many other forces we don't even know. So even if the universe looks very well structured, the Milky Way in the local group, in our super, super cluster, together we come a Berenice and, a, and Virgo cluster. Yes, it's well structured. It flickers in, I can observe this universe, but what when it flickers out? What do I know about the universe beyond this high sight or the universe beyond what my mind can perceive? My mind or any other mind, a genius mind, a Nobel Prize mind. I mean, are we sure that only by charting objective data, we are gonna get answer? Are we sure that there is not the other way that we can derive a lesson, we can derive information, a new principia to look at the universe. There must be other way. And that's what I hope for. That's what I hope my student, people attending this seminar will think about. There must be other way we can communicate with a universe that wants to talk. And I'm done. Okay, and thank you so much, so much to think about, uh, Theo. And uh, please stay on for um, our panel because I'm sure there'll be some very sharp questions for you, but I loved it every word you said. Thank you so much. Um, now, um, we are on to our, our last speaker. <clears throat> and um, that is, uh, um, I think it is uh, our one and only, um, one and only Dr. John Ramel. Dr. John Ramel is uh, um, with us, I saw some of his uh, chat. Um, John has been a long time NASA insider. And so I'm sure he was listening to some of the blasphemy that, that went on here. But you know what? He has some incredibly important things to tell you because he was in charge of planetary protection for the longest time that I remember him. And uh, I'm so happy you can be with us, John, and give it to us straight. You're going to take it. Um, <laughs> the floor is yours. We'll do the best we can, uh, Madhu. It's uh, one of those things I'm just glad I don't have to compete with Theo because I think she's got it going on. <laughs> Anyway, I do want to talk to you a little bit about uh, something that's not just planetary protection, but to inject a, a little bit of reality into the proceedings, at least from the perspective that I see it. Of course, we're all aware of this uh, Apollo 8 beautiful view of a, a pale blue dot way off in the distance, and it is everything to me. Every experience, every activity that we've had, uh, except for... Uh, a few people who got to be in the foreground of this picture um, 
most of the people by billion to one odds uh, have actually spent all of their time on the beautiful earth. And it's something that we need to take care of and something that I don't see people caring for as much as they should. Um, in particular, when we transfer what we've done on the earth to outer space, we have to be very careful about how we go because we have this problem that our ignorance perceives this. Uh, we never expected space debris to be such a problem, for example. We never took the uh, steps that were necessary to abate the space debris problem. Now we look at possible riches from cislunar space and the asteroid belt, but we don't really understand the physics of those locations, let alone the environments. Uh, and the economics of working there are, are not worked out very well. We could make a lot of mistakes that we can't afford and have no way to pick them up. So the stewards of those potentially rich locations, we have to wonder how far we can go before we regret what we've done. And I, I'm particularly concerned about uh, the human environment in space, um, all of the planets combined uh, that are not here do not equal one beautiful tropical rainforest. Uh, and although there are some places that look promising enough to have people propose to alternate uh, Mars as a home for the future of humanity, we're not very good at uh, figuring out what that's going to take. I will point out that if I see another all white spacesuit with no dust on it, on the moon or Mars, that we're missing a fundamental factor. Uh, dust to dust is what we're gonna have to deal with on any of these locations. Uh, and we forget that or we don't know that and our ignorance is profound. Uh, are we kidding ourselves in terms of whether we can actually use the planetary resources that are out there? Well, I think that there are lots of good intellectual property that deep space uh, industries brought forward, but economically uh, it's out of business and getting to a place where you can actually mine an asteroid to build a artificial gravity space station uh, is gonna take a long time. And we need to focus on that. And luckily with good instruction, uh, Mother here at uh, USC, uh, you can do that. It's important to remember Despite the wonders of the universe, there's no place like home. And we need to take care of that home and we need to be careful about how we go out into it. I'll point out that one of the things that concerns me is that the Artemis Accords, uh, as they were put together, have no environmental protections in them except for, for archeological sites. Uh, and I think that that's something that we might wanna look at in the future when we go forward to these places. So if we're gonna look at it from a perspective of a uh, you know, environmental ethicist, we look at Beyond Spaceship Earth. This is a relatively old book in 1987. And it's concerned with the moral status of the environment, what we can do, uh, looking at traditional ethical theories to shed light on concerns. Can all environmental ethics be fit with those theories? Well, probably not. Uh, anthropocentrism is the uh, leading edge of ethics. Um, we always worry about whether or not it will provide something good for humans. Uh, and the rest of the world uh, we see as having instrumental value only. The gold standard for moral standing is whether or not you're a human. But we <laughs> haven't found any non-humans yet. We may get some instruction in what to do about that. Um, but what do we do with non-biological beings? Uh, people talk about artificial intelligence as an extra, <laughs> existential threat, but they also could be friends. Uh, so how are we gonna deal with those? The Horda in Star Trek was a silicon-based life form. And the Borg, of course, um, was basically, Macintosh has gone crazy. Uh, what about inanimate objects, ecosystems, rocks, rivers, special places, an entire natural world that's out there? Every asteroid above the size of a dust particle, are they worth protecting? We don't even know what would happen if we removed uh, all the dust particles below that size. Uh, a basketball could be somebody's favorite uh, toy, but every dust particle, hard to say what we're going to preserve and what it would mean if we did remove it. Ecocentric holism is something that people look at where basically non-individuals or ethnic 
interconnected ecosystem. Individuals must be concerned with the whole community of life nature. And we're just realizing how integrated this is with the ability for humans to live on this planet. And the planet is pretty much um, on its own in terms of what we've been doing recently. But one thing about the earth, we know it's been different billions of years ago and the earth as a planet probably doesn't care. Uh, humans should strive to preserve ecological balance and stability. It's in their best interest to do so. Deep ecology is more of a philosophy that goes into um, identifying with nature, et cetera. And of course, if you saw the film Avatar, you'll understand that uh, all of this is connected and could be connected in a, a more fundamental way. One of the things that connects us all and what we don't really appreciate as much as we should is how much the microbial world connects us, whether we see it or not. Uh, and of course, COVID gives you an idea of how well it can uh, affect all of us. But there are lots of positive microbes out there, not just the ones that go into making beer, uh, but uh, that we depend on for our daily lives. So there's a narrow precautionary principle is that if an action or policy has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or the environment, in the absence of scientific consensus that the action or policy is harmful, the burden of proof that it is not harmful falls on those taking the action. And there are a lot of people out there who want to be actors, but we have to actually wonder whether or not uh, it makes sense. Should we spend valuable resources that could be used on Earth to explore the solar system? Well, yeah, I think a lot of us think that exploration is a human factor, but to focus on return on investment is another thing to do. And as a government program, it may not actually pay off uh, unless whoever uh, actually goes out into the solar system to do that uh, can be taxed. I mean, governments are businesses. How much do we have to know before we let humans go beyond Earth orbit and be exposed to planetary environments for the sake of the environment and also the sake of the humans? What kinds of non-human entities, if you run into them, should have intrinsic moral status? And what obligations do we have to living systems that are not part of the Earth's ecosystem? Well, clearly people brush their teeth at night uh, with the desire to kill off microbial ecosystems that live in their mouths. Well, we may or may not want to do that when we go elsewhere, but we don't know what the limits of the human ecosystem are. Where do they begin and end? The International Space Station is a wonderful example of a human ecosystem that's displaced. It's a built environment and something that uh, we don't control very well and we don't repair very well, which is one of the reasons why it might uh, sunset as a national laboratory in the 2030s. So we'll see how that goes. Um, what outer space locations might you want to apply ecocentrism to? Are, are there, as in Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars series, are there people who want Mars to stay the way it is? And how wide should the precautionary principle be for space exploration and how long? How do we affect future human beings with what we do now? So what are the ethics involved with space resource exploration and exploitation? And do governments of whatever level need to impose environmental regulations on commercial space companies? Well, most people think so. If you do a foam, you understand that People, as was mentioned earlier this morning by Alice Cohen, that people don't want to wake up in the morning and see a strip mine on the old face of the moon. Uh, even if it happens to bring them a lot of money in their account, there's a philosophy, there's a history, uh, and there's a prehistory associated with keeping the moon the way it is. And encouragement it isn't really gained through the terrestrial competitors in terms of mining, for example. What do they say about preserving the environment? Well, take somebody like Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto is kind of the bare face of uh, mining ethics. We recognize that our environmental performance is important to our host communities and that we are responsible for managing the impacts associated with our operations. It doesn't say anything about Rio Tinto caring about it it's themselves, but they know that if you pass a law that tells them they have to do something, they'll follow the law. 
Uh, this in Rio Tinto's uh, website is a mangrove swamp. And for those of you who have been to mangrove swamps, they look nothing like this. Freeport McMoran, a little bit better on the other side. Their objective is to be compliant with the laws and regulations and to minimize environmental impacts. So that's a, a very positive thing, but the problem is with mining, uh, especially mining on the earth, you have an issue with the environment. This is a tropical rainforest after it's been mined by Freeport McMoran. Um, doesn't look quite like the tropical rainforest that you might want to have there. Um, and so there's a, a mining company called uh, 911 Metallurgy that, that put together these charts about how moon mining could work. And they appears to be a mystical component to uh, current explanations about how it could work. And that's something that we can take a look at. Uh, they point out that the moon, a seemingly barren rock, may actually be a treasure trove of rare resources. Well, that's true, but we don't know actually how to get at that. And in phase two of this uh, lexicon, um, it would be irresponsible to proceed without fleshing this out a little bit better. We have phase one is go to the moon, phase two is a question mark, and phase three is we got minerals. But do we? Do we really know what's at the poles of the moon? Do we really know how to sustain an operation on the beginning uh, of ilmenite production, for example? Uh, it's still a lot of guesswork and not founded. So we need the investment to proceed with anything if we're going to do it responsibly. My concern is still going to affect how we go on from the United Nations Outer Space Treaty of 1967. No nation can claim ownership of the moon, but does that mean that the tragedy of the commons has to be repeated in outer space as it has on the earth? And I put in this part about, is this the best we can do? Because there's, as it says here, there's nothing stopping miners claiming property rights and using the moon as a commercial venture. Well, nothing other than economics and uh, practicality. And they say that the reality is until we get there and fight it out, we just have to wait and see. I don't think that's a very positive or ethical way to proceed for lunar mining. Uh, and I hope to uh, work with others, including um, the resource mining community to do a better job uh, at work understanding how private ownership of the material could actually happen rather than fighting it out. It would be crazy to do otherwise. It's clear that for some, going to space is like taking a mulligan in golf and they want to do over, getting a, take a quiz over at school. But it really should be about not making, about making a new life for humanity, not leaving the earth behind. Uh, and Calvin explains it best as he often does. Here's Calvin and Hobbes, really snowed last night, isn't it wonderful? Everything familiar has disappeared, the world looks brand new. A new year, a fresh clean start. It's like having a big white sheet of paper to draw on, a day full of possibilities. It's a magical world, Hobbes. Let's go exploring. Yeah, it's also a very nice yeah, encouragement to go exploring today. Thank you very much, Mato. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. You know, uh, just this morning, uh, and this has happened in the past too, um, I come down to the kitchen and there are a bunch of ants. And, and, and not many, I, I spotted maybe a dozen or two. They were all in different parts and they were, they were moving around. And I was going like, these are explorers. <laughs> and they, and they're looking to survive. And uh, uh, once they find something, and uh, the hope is that they will feed back uh, to uh, the, the nest, and then a chain will develop, which we have seen in the past. And I remember uh, it was a Dick Feynman who, who talked about ants and how, how they how they propagate and move and so on. Um, I think 
despite what Elon Musk calls the lighter consciousness, we are no better. I mean, you know, we, uh, we want to survive and we want to thrive and we'll do it at any cost. Um, and even though, as you point, pointed out what uh, the mining companies are doing, I mean, they have, they have offices that look, just spend their time and research on how to find loopholes to conduct business, economic business. And um, if you remember, uh, the Churchill government was, was bidden by a smog in London. And uh, then we had the acid rain messing our forests up not too long ago. And then the examples it cost. So, so there, there, is many, there are many reasons to think that we have a long way to go uh, to understand the environmental implications before we before, before we pursue the actions, and that that came across very clearly in your slides. Um, thank you, um, can't thank you enough, John. Now, um, I, I will point out that you know back in the days of severe air pollution around places like Gary, Indiana, etc. Um, LA too, Los the, Angeles too. The solution was taller smokestacks to export the problem farther and farther away. And you can look at the moon as a tall smokestack uh, and it will export all the mining and all the problems uh, to the moon, to the asteroids, et cetera. But we really don't know how to do that right now. We don't even know what happens when you land something large on the moon and whether or not rocks picked up uh, on the moon that way will come around uh, in orbit and hit you. Um, we just have a lot of basic uh, things that we need to do and we need to be alert to our ignorance. You know, I was sitting in a lecture with this famous astronaut sitting next to me. And then there was this talk about something similar and you whispered at me and yet we will do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, now um, folks, I can't thank you enough for uh, joining us in this uh, very interesting event. I hope the proceeding, Ken, Ken is very, very uh, good at um, archiving materials that I hope uh, people will enjoy during uh, Christmas holidays. But I want to open at this time it to the folks who are here, um, starting with, our, uh, with Gordon. And um, it, let me pose uh, some questions to all of you here. Um, and then uh, we'll take some questions from our, our delightful audience too. Um, let me start and let's make our answers brief because we can go into dinner time folks, but I don't think Ken will like that or anybody else will for that matter. So let me go with uh, first with, uh, oh gosh, I made so many notes here. <clears throat> Um, Arthur, I mean, uh, with Gordon, uh, did you want to tell us anything? Uh, did you want to tell us? Did you want to tell us anything more about um, this term called uh, serendipity? And again, it's beautiful to see. Uh, some of the other speakers resonate along this time, coincidences, serendipity. Uh, did you have, would you like to tell us something, um, Gordon? Yeah, I mean, uh, Gust uh, Gonzalo Munivar uh, frankly overstates his case. Uh, but what he's trying to say is that whenever you do science, good things happen. Now I can take that up to a point, but there are limits to it. Um, and the happy accidents are you look for one thing, you discover something quite different. Um, Einstein was talking about what it would be like to uh, sit on a light ray, and we end up with medical lasers. Um, you can get all sorts of um, interesting things, and you never know where you're going. Um, that's basically what I think Munivar was getting at. <clears throat> that's one of the concepts of his that I actually like. I have some fairly sharp disagreements with him. For one thing, he's a thoroughgoing relativist, and I'm a realist. So we don't see eye to eye on that, but um, that's one of his better ideas, I think. Excellent. Um, you know, and, and this is true. You know, I think um, that uh, chance, accidents, 
and uh, events don't always follow the scientific method that we are taught in schools and we uh, we profess to our students. Um, uh, many times in the history of our our species, uh, things have taken turns uh, because of uh, what you would call uh, a lucky accidents. And uh, uh, so that's a very important point that uh, several of you made. Um, I want to ask, uh, oh, I'm losing my cards again here. Uh, I want to ask uh, Jim uh, about uh, uh, equity which again, uh, your uh, a fellow citizen from Hawaii mentioned as equality and egalitarianism. And in space activities, uh, it is clear, at least at this time, that uh, uh, it costs a whole bunch of money to, to do anything, uh, anything, any mission. Um, how do you propose uh, the developing you know, that's a strange term too. When we say developing term, you're talking to 5,000, 10,000 year old civilizations across the globe. I mean, they are far, far more attuned to what that term development means than we are uh, in our, in our uh, uh, Northern uh, American uh, connotation of that word. And um, how, how do you expect these um, nations uh, who are grappling and starting to evolve a, uh, a space infrastructure of sorts, uh, how do you expect them to contribute, Jim? Uh, well, I, I think what we need to do is consider, I like to think of the concept of a rainbow. What are the opportunities for humanity going into space? And what is the bottom line for space exploration and development? If we collaborate, I mean, there are various cultures around the world with different perspectives on priorities, what's, what's important, what isn't, what's acceptable, what isn't. Uh, but if you look at the big picture, you step back and say, how through collaboration can space exploration and development advance humanity, humankind, and come to some sort of a baseline definition of what constitutes humanity, what the priorities for humanity's development should be, how space intertwines, with that uh, evolution, and then just find those common bottom lines that transgress cultural differences and, and unite us as human beings. Good point. Um, you know, I think I think uh, uh, I think also that uh, uh, when we think space, um, we always think rockets and rockets and spacecraft and um, and uh, people in. Um, um, in spacesuits and so on. But that is not what all space is about. Even during the Apollo program, there were thousands of small companies producing um, uh, things for the, the, uh, the missions. And they did not all have to be rockets. They did not all have to be um, uh, related directly to that mission. So, so, so that is the way we can engage the globe, I suppose, Jen. Yeah. Um, and, uh, let me go to Adriano. That was a fine presentation from um, Adriano. Is he, is he here, uh, Ken? Yes, oh, I'm oh. here. Yeah. You know, uh, you I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I cannot show you my face because I am in the bed not, uh, right now. Okay. Hey, I, buenas I, I, ciao, buenas Jim. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> ciao. I'm, I'm sorry that I felt very well just in, in, in the, in the uh, half an hour where I should present and so on. But however, now now I feel better, but it's better not to show you. <laughs> okay. My uh, okay. Thank, thank you for your excellent slide set. Please send that slide set uh, to Ken uh, as opposed to just the video recording, uh, Adriana, because we also attach a slide set to our proceedings so that people can okay. go over these we'll slides. I'm so glad you mentioned um, in historical detail um, you know, some of the uh, precedents uh, in, uh, in this arena of uh, looking at why we do the things we do. And um, you also mentioned uh, the chasm between the rich and the poor. And uh, again, um, uh, Adriano, you come from a very old culture yourself. Uh, uh, you know, um, 
China, India, uh, Russia, uh, all of those old cultures have deep insights into how uh, humanity operates. And uh, <laughs> Fio two is nodding there because all of you know that, you know, um, science, scientific technology and um, the space activity and physical space activity are just um, icing on the cake of what, uh, what humanity is all about. Um, now, uh, I was reminded of a saying that, you know, we will all, <laughs> we will all be, we are, we are all going to be in it globally or we are all going to perish. And you're absolutely right. During the American Revolution, somebody said that. Uh, we wrote up that constitution and uh, uh, we had guns to our head from different nations saying, you know, um, uh, this, is not, this is impossible. You just got a bunch of ideas. Uh, the rest of the countries uh, live on history, you know, of thousands of years. And you got a bunch of, a bunch of just a bunch of ideas. And um, um, the pressure was on, on the founders. And I don't know who said this, maybe, maybe Gordon knows. Um, if we don't hang together, we will surely hang separately. Who said that, Gordon? You don't, you don't know. Uh, it's, I can't remember. I'll see if I can find out. That yeah. was uh, Ben Franklin, I think. That's right. I think it was Ben, too. But anyhow, it is true. It is true. I mean, these are issues where everybody, everybody is asked to contribute and to, to be together as a species. Because I have a slide, I think I'll try to show it to you. Mother, age, Mother Nature, I, I, I don't want to use the term sentient, but she has seen through billions of years of evolution. And she has just kicked yeah. species out if she didn't find them <laughs> accommodating to natural values that uh, uh, Theo mentions. So it's only clear that, and that you either, <laughs> You either uh, uh, follow the rules or you're going to break your head on the wall yourself. And uh, that came across very clearly through Theo. And uh, um, thank you, Adriano. And to Alice, yes, indeed, uh, the orbital debris problem uh, is very, very serious. And uh, uh, usually, Alice, in our species, and particularly in our culture in the United States, we always react, we never act. And that is kind of sad because right now, somebody in the policy department that, that Mike probably knows is, is saying, wait, wait, let us see what the others are going to do so that we can beat them. I, I, I don't know how long we can do that kind of thing, but um, it came across very well, Alice. And I did not know about that Australian satellite that was launched in 1970. Thank you for that information. <laughs> It's always good to have professors of anthropology, of archaeology, remind us um, where we've been in the past. Mm -hmm. And to Samir, uh, you stun us with your graphics. And um, uh, I, I can tell that you're following the literature uh, quite seriously. Uh, but uh, again, uh, uh, listen to John a bit. Don't take it too seriously because uh, uh, people like uh, you know, some of you, you know, I think you know that um, um, our friend Pascal Lee did propose the idea of uh, uh, you know, finding resources at Thelalius Crater in the northern uh, region of the moon. <laughs> and I received a couple of emails from scientists saying that, oh, no, it is an entirely different matter. But that's how science proceeds with debates and discussions. If I, if I can, Madhu. Madhu, if I can just add a few uh, considerations to, to, uh, to, to what you, you, you just said. You mentioned yeah. the American uh, Revolution. That's a very important to me. Uh, Robert Piercing, that is one of my philosophical maestro, wrote that the contribute uh, of America to the world is uh, freedom, the concept of freedom. Yeah. And it comes from the Native Americans. 
It comes from the, from the, from the yes, uh, Robert Pinsig is a, an, a, was an anthropologist and uh, he studied, uh, okay, I don't want to make now a, a lecture on Robert Pinsig, but okay. it would be worse, it would be worth to, to do it. And uh, he said that the contribute of America to the world, to humanity, is the concept of freedom, the mm -hmm. indom indomite uh, sense of freedom of the Native Americans that transmitted to mm -hmm. the uh, to the people that went to to colonize, mm -hmm. uh, sadly to colonize in a bad way the, the North North America. That is and, yeah, that and is that is true. that it resonates very much with the history of life on this planet. That is life uh, is an history of a struggle. Um, uh, struggle against uh, entropy, against uh, the ferocious love of nature. Uh, so it is like if nature itself put a seed, an evolutionary seed, in the matter, in the inorganic matter before the organic uh, uh, matter. That is something that is, it works against the law of nature. It works uh, for evolution. So this evolutionary impulse uh, is, is uh, fascinating me from uh, since a long time. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do is to finally try to focus on humans, because there is very much to study about humanity, yeah. um, at least the same amount of thing that we have to study in nature. And we, uh, while, while we go ahead studying nature, we couldn't, uh, we shouldn't forget to study humanity. It's a huge variety of types, I am fascinated by Howard Garner and Stephen Wolf and the combination of their uh, classification of types, attitudes, and in types of intelligences. And yeah. that gives give me the measure of how much we are really different. And each one of us is precious. Each, each human life is very, very much precious yeah. and worth to be conserved and uh, continued with the descendants and the prolification and so on. So I think it's it's time that somebody start defending the concept of uh, growth, of numerical growth also, demographic growth. Yeah, that, and, uh, and I think that, so this is, is the sense of my work on, on humanism, is this yes, one, on philosophical yes, I know, And I, I enjoy your slides very much. And in particular, like the metaverse slide, where you had, uh, where you had avatars uh, walking among us, and uh, I, I, I had an exclamation mark which said no virus, and uh, and uh, <laughs> I thought I thought that's how uh, we right now we are interacting that way, you know, uh, physically uh, without exchanging germs. Um, but uh, I also want you to look at the work of uh, Rachel Armstrong. Do you know her? Uh, well, it's not the name is not new to me, but uh, it, it is moment I, I cannot say. Well, well, I thought you would know her because uh, she proposed a concept to keep uh, Venezia uh, above the water by building um, uh, underwater uh, biological structures. And, yes. Uh, uh, you may want to connect with her. I think uh, I, I just exchanged some notes with her. I will send you an email. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, relax and enjoy the rest, uh, Adriano. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me, and it was a wonderful conference. Even <laughs> if I, I follow the so and so, not completely, but however, it was very very interesting. I'm Thank also you. curious curious about Fiorella Terenzi. I think uh, I think she's from Italy, and I will try to to mm. uh, to contact her to to know more about her study. Okay. Thank you. Now um, Anita has left us, but. Uh, she mentioned certain things that are important. One is interoperability. I think that uh, that comes up in uh, even the Artemis Accords and before in our wonderful uh, Moon Village Association dialogues and then in Jim um, um, Christopher's address too, that's important. And uh, the hydrogen economy, it's here already. And um, I don't know if you know, uh, but the Tokyo Olympics was run on a hydrogen economy. And they had fuel cells running uh, the, the whole time. Uh, and then for uh, uh, Mike, uh, we, we'll, spend our, we'll spend our time in the evenings discussing Mike, but uh, you know, chaos uh, is the condition of, uh, of uh, the human uh, 
uh, a human condition. And uh, uh, again, uh, quantum mechanics tries to put some structure into it. And so I think rather than uh, dissipate or think it's going to go away, I think we have to make use of it. I think uh, um, um, there was that famous Nobel laureate who wrote about it uh, um, in, in chemistry, uh, Prigogine. Do you know that name, Ilya Prigogine? Uh, he wrote about chaos and how it's important. And then uh, um, uh, Sitin Mihaly, he talks about, talks about flow. And uh, those are interesting terms that to study about. Uh, Phnom, are you there? Yes, I see you. Um, wonderful slides and a lot of material, a lot of food for thought. I wanted Loretta in this meeting, but uh, she is busy getting a Christmas tree up and they're up in the East Coast. Um, now, a few days ago, did you, did you dial into the six uh, finals, uh, Phnom? Um, uh, um, Olga just ran uh, the uh, Masters finals and uh, I was there and uh, there was one. I was not. I, I was know. not, but I went to U of H last week. Oh, okay. and I saw her. Yeah. Okay. She um, uh, had one one student present uh, about uh, um, VR, VR tech, and uh, I was curious to know if if, if these VR things affect uh, human psychology and physiology. Uh, in, in, in real ways so that once you're engaged in VR for several hours or as part of routine, then you come out into real life and it does it affect you, uh, uh, a bit, your ability uh, to conduct business in the physical, um, the physical world. Uh, and uh, I also enjoyed your take on space food, which was presented by, I, I mean, uh, a facet of it was presented at the finals. I think you'd like to see it when the archives come out. And uh, uh, you know, thank you for joining us, but I'm sure you'll get some questions on it. And Fio, where's Fio? Fio, the cell, the human cell, you know, I used to go on long walks with my dad, who was a pathologist. And he would say, almost all the time he would say, if you, if you really look at how the cell um, it manages uh, its materials, uh, its waste, its recycling. Uh, you will really understand how life could work if we worked efficiently. And there is the term, I think uh, it's from the Greek, apotopsis, where um, uh, you know, cell causes parts of it to die, to regenerate. And uh, in fact, uh, that Japanese scientist won the Nobel uh, two or three years ago on that topic, apotopsis. And uh, John hit it on the head uh, with the, uh, uh, the need to know uh, before you do something. And uh, you know, in architecture, we do that, John. It's called the environmental impact study. And we balance the pros and cons. And that's why many projects get shelved, you know, before uh, things can happen. But you're right. We have to be far more aggressive, uh, and uh, you know that phase one, phase two, question mark, and phase three, everything is done. That's not the way the, the structures get built. But uh, anyway, thank you all. Now I'm ready to open up to questions from all of you. Um, uh, can can you repeat some questions, or do you want me to do that? One question that came on the Q and A. Um, from Sina was, um, she asked something about um, to feel about how does um, um, how does um, uh, quantum um, how does uh, um, uh, entropy uh, work with what you are suggesting? And also, she believes to sum it up, one needs to merge quantum field theory gas dynamics and cosmology all together. Maybe there are many more. <laughs> what did you want to say, Fio? I think Dr. Terenzi answer was text, but uh, she's 
welcome to speak out or answer again here. Go for it. Um, in a nutshell, um, I do believe that we are going to find uh, a new physics, a new cosmology by merging all these uh, different approach. Of course, we need a supercomputer. Uh, I, I doubt that the size of this brain is going to be able to derive uh, you know, those principles that we need to unify the first field, for instance. Uh, but uh, so we together with the supercomputer help and our brain, but our brain has to be able to embrace both, right? Has to embrace reason and imagination, science and art, consciousness and philosophy. If we start to break down again, then it will be difficult to tap into... Uh, this field where perhaps uh, maybe there is another universe. Yeah, you know, our, our, our school of thought has always been from Socrates uh, through Plato and Aristotle to separate things and study them. And that has evolved even into the universities. Uh, we are all partitioned so, so narrowly that it's hard for you to be wholesome in your um, in your aspects, and that is a shame, because in the old systems you were uh, Vitruvius. You know, look at Vitruvius' writings. He says uh, to be a, a wholesome architect, you need to know a lot of things, and uh, you can't escape that. You know, and uh, uh, I think in some ways our students now are getting used to that. Um, beside going to school. They have things like YouTube, um, and they have this incredible knowledge uh, on um, on the web, and uh, they ask questions and um, and become good at it. Uh, I think uh, so. That was question. Uh, Can I just uh, make a small addition, if I may? Uh, please. Yeah, well, uh, quantum computing is one of the pressing issues that I do believe it will be paving the way for, for the next revolution. We are now uh, witnessing the fourth industrial revolution and the, the, the digital transformation. But at the end of the fourth industrial revolution and with the inventing of the quantum computing, it will unlock a new kind of science. It will be unlocking the, uh, the parallel world theory it will be a reality. You know, starting from the thick sixth dimension to the tenth dimension, we can now generate uh, not only theories, we can understand and uh, understand the logic behind the formation of the universe and how it will be ending. And uh, based on that, it will be choosing for us the best course of action to deal with those uh, findings. So quantum computing is the fundamental knowledge and the fundamental science that will be paving the way for us for space exploration and for space colonization. So thank you for that question. Yeah, and, um, and quantum physics too, is limiting in our knowledge, uh, Samir. Um, you know, one of the first experiments in quantum physics is the double slit experiment. I think all of us know about this. Yeah. And um, yeah, it, it goes down much earlier to the time when um, Isaac Newton proposed that light was particles. And then uh, <laughs> and somebody said it was waves. And then the double slit yeah. Uh, experiment uh, puts us in a in a mode where it goes it's both a particle and a wave and, and waves, you're going yeah. like uh, uh, you know your mind starts to wonder uh, how do you frame it um, besides showing it in some equations and you know because uh, the nature of the world um, is uh, is real most of it you know so uh, there are things we will see explained more in the future science. I was talking to this older doctor from China about Chinese medicine. And, uh, and, and then I said, some of those things are not logical. And she says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everything is not logic because science is only a few hundred years old and uh, experience is a few thousand years old. So, so, so you have to take everything um, with, by saying that science is growing, right? Fio, that's how you say it too. Um, Alice, did you have some comments? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Kaya, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, this idea 
of museums because I think it was, uh, who was it? Uh, Gordon will again tell us, who was it who said that um, if, you don't, um, if you don't remember your history, you're bound to repeat it. Santayana was it, or one of the one of the Spanish philosophers? Um, uh, I think, yeah. Anyhow, so that's great, and uh, uh, I'm open to getting some questions before we. Well, it's already two. two uh, or, Sina, Sina, I want to ask a question. Has joined us here now. I want to tell you a little story about this uh, uh, neuroscientist doctor who is an anesthesiologist. Uh, I had started teaching um, the Space Concept Studio uh, back in the early 90s. And there was this one student who would drive from San Diego uh, to Los Angeles to our paint campus to sit into my lecture. This went on for a few, a few months and uh, she did very well in the class. Uh, if I remember right, uh, uh, you worked a paper on interstellar flight and um, she walked away with a good grade too. And now um, Divya, who graduated from um, Harvard and St uh, Stanford and uh, UCSD, San Diego, uh, is now back at uh, in San Francisco. Am I right, Divya? Yes, I'm in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, I know you. I know you sat into a few a few sessions. Did you have some thoughts? Um, yeah, I'm sorry I missed a lot of the sessions. Um, I, I think I caught them from uh, from Theo on or something. Um, I, I'm just playing with, I mean, I, I, as a neuroscientist, I think a lot, and I study consciousness, so I actually map uh, neural networks as humans pass through different stages of consciousness and write algorithms to automate that process. Uh, but some of the universal definitions we find in, um, in defining what a conscious brain is are actually very applicable to defining a state of consciousness for the universe, I suppose you could say. Um, we find that when uh, brains are less conscious, whether it is through mechanisms of sleep, um, anesthesia, induced unconsciousness, or coma, uh, brains become fractured and more disconnected. Um, they also are able to calculate less information. And we just published a paper showing that there's, um, those brains also express less complexity. And you can characterize the brain in terms of its neural dynamics and all these different states as chaotic attractors. And there are a lot of parallels to, I mean, it's almost like a, a fractal concept. You know, you could take brain derived consciousness, but that's probably a very, very small portion of the total potential consciousness that could be expressed by the universe. Um, and I, I kind of look forward to um, extending these ideas in terms of brain mapping to, uh, to studying what it might mean in terms of connecting up all these disparate pieces of the universe and what that expression might look like. Um, I'm also working with the uh, chief scientist at SETI right now to use some of the co concepts of brain mapping uh, to look for perhaps intelligent life in the universe. And the reason for this is that um, when we study uh, intelligence, not necessarily in humans, but let's say in animals, we don't really have um, a lot of means of communicating with them. So almost all of our metrics are indirect. We either have to make observations based on behavior uh, or observations based on recordings of their brain. And in some sense, what we're searching for in the universe is very similar to searching for intelligence in animals because we don't exactly know what the language is going to be. We don't actually know what that, you know, electromagnetic spectrum or signature is going to look like. But if we use some of these methods that we use for indirect mapping of intelligence and consciousness in the brain, uh, in non-human brains, we may be able to extend this for searching for life in the universe. Uh, so those are my immediate comments. Interesting, very interesting. Um, Divya has also done some work um, at Stanford in optogenetics, which is very interesting to me, that new subject um, that talks about how light can interact and uh, do things uh, for our brain. Um, uh, Elif has got a hand up. Elif, it's good to see you. Uh, uh, Elif is uh, looking at joining the Sapienza. So for all of you from Italy, uh, you're going to see a, a new face at that university. Uh, Elif, what was your question? Yeah, actually I wrote on the journey, but I can uh, tell. Uh, actually, mine is about uh, robots with uh, AI. 
we, as you know, that with the development in the space industry, we also developed the robots with uh, artificial intelligence. But when the robots combine with the artificial intelligence, some something scary developing at the same time. Uh, so do you think that one day the space will be for robots only? Because in uh, when time passes, uh, this development uh, removed the need of uh, human power. So uh, the question is that, do you think that the one day the space will be for robots, not for humankind? <laughs> oh, ooh, that's a hard one. Uh, uh, you know, some people think so, uh, really, but I'm not a believer in that because uh, um, we will always, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, we'll always be, uh, <laughs> we create these things. And uh, 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 Gordon, did you want to take that um, question? You want to turn on? Um, I honestly don't know. Um, my impression is that for deep space, at least in the short term, it will be robots only. But once we've got the capability of getting humans out there, I'm really not sure. Um, I mean, it sounds like you're talking about the Terminator scenario, <laughs> where um, you have artificial intelligences that suddenly become sentient and uh, decide to get rid of the rest of us. Um, I, mean, I don't have a straight answer for okay. that. I'm sorry. Can I have an addition? I have Alan, something to share with. you want with. to say something? Yeah. I'll, I'll say something briefly to this, I guess. So there's a, a, you know, a long running debate about whether humans need to be in space at all, given that robots can do almost everything we need to be done. Um, and of course, as, uh, as AIs become more sophisticated and we see um, how they're being utilised in planetary exploration. Um, that question keeps arising. But, uh, you know, we know we've, we've had um, permanent human occupation in low Earth orbit for only a bit over 20 years now. We know that the effects of microgravity on human bodies are, are pretty bad. Um, the other places we've been have been um, one-sixth Earth gravity, Mars is a third, I think. Uh, we have basically no idea what the long-term uh, impacts of different gravity are on human uh, development, uh, aging, all kinds of things. We don't know what those long-term effects are. Um, so we're in an information vacuum as far as that goes. But what we do know suggests that, um, you know, maybe adapting to different gravity and different radiation environments is, uh, you know, a very long-term evolutionary process and for the time being um, uh, my personal opinion is is multi-planetary occupation uh, is a little bit of uh, uh, an unrealistic dream great um, uh, john rummel would you like to say something in this regard i think john had to leave yeah that's right okay um, uh, uh, i have something if i may you okay? Uh, well, uh, talking about AI, there are three different levels according to scientists of the AI. The narrow AI is the kind of Siri kind of AI that we all have on our iPhones. And then there's the general AI and then there's the super AI, the one that maybe Elif is scared of a little bit. <laughs> AI is considered one of the, non, one of the anthropogenic uh, uh, existential risks that we might face someday. But on the other hand, we have created nuclear uh, energy and uh, we can control it. And I do believe that the same will apply for this kind of AI. On the other hand, the robotics is essential for the space colonization exploration. They are expendable and they do not cost our life. We, we are saving our life and completing our missions. So combining both, I think it will give us a longer arm to do what we really need to do. And taking uh, decisions at a crisis or at a moment that we need someone, maybe we are facing some kind of a mental block and we need aid. I think AI will be our uh, emergency aid at that time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Samir. You know, uh, maybe Divya can answer this. Um, you know, there are many, many um, philosophical ideas, Divya, about us uh, not using 
um, our brain uh, to the maximum capacity are not even coming close to a fraction of what the brain is capable of. And, you know, I come from an old culture and I have seen things that um, uh, people do, uh, uh, you know, and, and I go totally suspended disbelief that hey, this is not happening for real. Um, uh, so do you have some, uh, some data or thoughts on uh, human capacity as it exists now and um, how uh, we are trapped in the logical framework of the last few hundred years of science and unable to break through uh, to, new, um, to new ways of thinking and uh, new ways of using um, a little more of our brain, <laughs> if, if you want to call it that. Sure, so it sounds like you're talking about Siddhis, right? Um, those sorts of super uh, human extraordinary feats. That's what and... my professor would call it. Right. Sup <laughs> Once in a while, he would, see, he would say, <laughs> Madhu, use your supralogical skills. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I wanted to, um, actually I had wanted to answer the uh, question that came before, but I'm going to now combine the two answers. Um, I will answer that question about how much we use of our brain and its networks in just a moment, but I wanted to link it back to the initial question about exploration of space with robots. I think um, that what's been created is a somewhat artificial distinction between robots, AI, and humans. Um, and at a very practical level, um, yeah, we're probably going to be doing a lot of robotic-based exploration initially. Um, the second phase, which is already occurring, is actually a combination of human and machine interfaces, right? So mm -hmm. there is no way that humans are going to be going into space and exploring entirely under their own power. That connection between human and machine is going to be instrumental in helping us do science help us, helping us to live, helping us to practice medicine. Um, and those same lessons are already being brought back to earth in the sense that there are a lot of human machine interfaces, especially in my field of medicine um, that take place. But the third piece of it, which some are alluded to was the development of artificial general intelligence, which is a form of artificial intelligence that is not solely based on machine learning algorithms. And people often conflate the two. Um, artificial general intelligence, um, which is what Ray Kurzweil was referring to when he talked about reaching the singularity where say computers would potentially be able to reach um, the level of computation, at least of, of a human brain or even a non-humans brain, a vertebrate brain like a mouse. Um, we're supposed to be there in a few years, according to him. But, but this idea is that um, machines and logic boards can eventually express a type of intelligence that organic matter has been able to express and what I want to say is I think that there is, in studying consciousness, there's, I, I think that there's actually an artificial distinction between thinking that organic and inorganic are so different um, and that the organic may eventually fuse with an organic and create entirely new kinds of consciousness interfaces um, or the inorganic may be able to express it on its own. I mean, if you look at the universe, it's, it's a combination of these types of, of matter, both inorganic and organic. And so I think, again, it's, it's artificial to think that they are distinct from one another. And I think that what is more important is having networks, whether they are entirely organic or inorganic or a mix, hybrid networks, uh, being able to function together uh, rather than as discrete modules into something that can actually organize information, calculate upon it, um, and then express, express something new from it, which is what Shannon's information theory says that we do. Uh, if the universe and everything in it are, are bits, um, that's what's so exciting about the universe is its ability to transform. And getting back to your question, Madhu, about um, then the limitation of human computation in brains, this idea that we only use a fraction of our brains is actually incorrect. Um, it's, it's based on this limited understanding of what neural networks need to survive. And our brain takes up about 20 to 25 percent of our cardiac output even though it's about one eighth of our mass mm -hmm. and that means that uh, it requires an enormous amount of blood glucose and oxygen to survive and thrive and what your brain is doing at any given moment is it's performing an optimization function it's basically balancing the metabolic energy sources available to it with what it's able to produce so the organism can survive in its current ecological niche and whatever environment it finds itself in and 
if called upon to utilize more of those resources in any given moment, say to perform cities or incredible acts like, you know, yeah. um, mothers lifting cars off infants, then you can't understand where that muscle power would come from. Uh, that's really based on the neural network responding to an environmental set of conditions and maybe calling upon extra metabolism. What I find interesting about the connection between inorganic and organic is that if we were to plug brains up into multiple networks, which has been already tried using uh, non-invasive um, brain reading and neuromodulation, so connecting almost in telepathic networks or connecting humans to computers and uh, commuting elements, which is a form of a brain machine interface, yeah. there you might have a limitless supply of power because you can plug in the inorganic. And if that's the case, and you can draw on energy from other sources, you may see the expression of extraordinary states of both consciousness and computation that weren't available before. So interesting. I'll stop there. Very, very interesting. You know, in, in, in the Advaita philosophy of Shankara, he clearly says the distinction between what we observe as life and animate versus what is around us, which we think of as inanimate, does not exist, uh, 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 Divya. And, uh, yeah, and, and Madhu, if, if, if that wasn't the case previously, it will be the case. Because I agree with Divya, if you, if you look at Kurzweil in the, in the arguments about singularity, in 10 years time, it will be impossible to make a differentiation of what, what is human, what is silicon, what is AI, yeah. what is augmented. And I think that's exactly what we need to do to, to become a multi-planetary species. And I think that you know, maybe the metaphor to think about in terms of robotics, if you want to, if you want to initially split it off, it's really the co-evolution of humans and canines, right? Because, you know, when, when wolves became domesticated and became canines, there was a process of co-evolution where both uh, humans changed and, and dogs changed. And that's what I think might have, might be the metaphor for space robotics and humans, but it's going to be incredibly integrated and beyond recognition even in 10 years. Interesting thought. Kaya, did you want to say something? Uh, am I unmuted? Yeah, I think that's uh, maybe just uh, a comment from before when you mentioned uh, museums and heritage. I might just want to comment um, about, it's really about the future and uh, learning from the past. And uh, there is a quote, um, I don't remember from who, looking back to look forward. So um, I think it's pretty important to think like that. And also um, when we think about heritage, um, it's actually a construct of the present. It's not that much about the past because what we consider as heritage, it's what we consider today. Um, so um, yeah, when we think about museums, uh, we need to think how we can utilize those concepts uh, and learn from um, and bring forward. Uh, Fio, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I want to say that I want to learn from the brain of an insect. I want to learn from the brain of a dog or of a dolphin, a whale. Until then, I don't think I'm going to get a clue of what's going on. <laughs> Interesting. You know, yeah, or their experience. Uh, you know, when, when I think, I think probably Mike was there um, at the ISU. A session when uh, 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 Professor Ian McHard um, uh, uh, was a well-known uh, city designer um, at Harvard and a policy person. So um, I'm waiting at the stage to introduce him. Uh, he comes up to me and he says, I don't know anything about space. Can you help me? So I says, no, you don't have to talk about space. You just need to relate your experience in the design of, of cities. And then he looked at me and said, if the good Lord looks at how we treat the infrastructure and build and rebuild, he will very simply say, next time, no brains. 
<laughs> remove, remove the brain and you'll be just normal like the rest of the creatures. Um, but uh, you're, you're right, you know, um, ants, termites, bees, and living things. Um, and, and, and the thing is, uh, they have survived several extinction events. So they must be doing something right. And, and while we are faced with this threat of, of being wiped off the planet because of uh, our industrial uh, wanton. But anyhow, um, I want to share a last few slides if I can make that happen. And then um, we should close. Uh, uh, can you uh, see my slides, folks, now? Are you able to see it? Oh, yes, right. yes, they are there. Now, I know the astronomers in this group will know where this camera is focused on. Um, but anyhow, uh, you know, so I'm so glad to have, have had all of you um, giving us all these inputs and we'll proceed uh, to our next event in, in the new year sometime when Ken gets, um, uh, give, gives me the go. Now, um, we should all conclude with a few points that resonated throughout our ideas. We all know the definition of philosophy from Google, just kidding. <laughs> but we know that it's about the nature of knowledge. It is the part of the human consciousness that wants to probe where we, what are we, where are we going? Are we alone? Uh, are, are there other um, other uh, uh, life in the universe. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke um, tells us, uh, in either case, if we find that we are totally alone or if we have companions in other places, uh, it would still be a tremendous shock on the system uh, to know either case. Uh, and so um, uh, the fundamental uh, uh, the reason for philosophy in general and space philosophy in particular is because we want to know the why of things before um, to make our collective gatherings of people, you know, large forces are involved in all our scientific pursuits, including space activities. Um, it, to know why we do something and, and transmit it to the collective helps us to organize better. And, um, and philosophy leads to vision. And that's what makes our ideologies of different nations, and we are, we are, uh, you know, throwing stakes, uh, throwing rocks and stakes, and hit each other because our ideology is the best. Nobody else can think right, though they have lived for ten thousand, <laughs> thousand years. You know, this is not right, and so um, we should be thinking about, about uh, how um, uh, um, the policy is shaped by philosophies, deep set philosophies, and. Um, uh, um, Steve mentioned that our constitution is very, very small. The preamble tells you, you know, that God gives us the inalienable rights to freedom. And I think somebody else too mentioned this. And these are ideas. <laughs> these are ideas of the last three or, three or 400 years uh, compared to nations that have existed for thousands of years. So we don't want to challenge those aspects, but we, we do the best we can. Um, Space philosophy provides direction and vision because we are able to give the collective momentum to make projects happen. Um, I'm told that um, uh, Jeff Bezos has called the first day letter that he continuously promotes, asking people, why, are you, why is Amazon doing what we're doing? And it, it regenerates um, the, the, the focus of, uh, of uh, the, their company. And there is also an author by the name of uh, Simon Sinek. Uh, he goes around the corporate world preaching why you do something uh, leads to what and how. And so these are the beautiful people we saw today. I'm so thankful to all of you for joining us. And I'm so happy that, uh, um, that our uh, uh, welcome speaker, um, uh, astronaut uh, um, Nicole Stott, uh, read out some of these uh, pieces um, you know, from our intro. 
thank you so much, Nicole, for joining us. Now, I want, <laughs> we are all amateur astronomers, one way or the other. I mean, if you don't look at the skies, <laughs> you've been missing a lot you know, for the last, uh, 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 you know, for the last uh, years of your life. But uh, now, <clears throat> uh, when you look to the south, particularly during uh, the summer months, <clears throat> you'll see one of my favorite constellations, Scorpio here. That's Antares right here. And then, oh, I gotta go back one minute. <clears throat> if you look straight through Lupus and into Centaurus, everybody knows what Alpha Centauri is, right? But then there's something very interesting. 2000 years ago, 2000 years ago, the philosophers saw this and they said, there's something riding the horse of the centaur and it is not a star. <laughs> it was a long way back. And it's it only like um, during Edmund Halley that he, he said, hey, listen, this is what we would call uh, a conglomeration of stars, uh, a, globe, a global cluster. And uh, these objects defy us to the day. Uh, we classify their stars, we call them population two stars, uh, not heavy in metals, so it should be very old. Yes, we think they are 12 billion years old, but these are all stories that we don't have a handle because we're just looking at them billions of miles away. Uh, you know, uh, it happens to be moving uh, with a uh, rest frame around our galactic plane, so we think it's part of a galaxy. And millions of stars are in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a globe like this. Uh, on a good day, in the evening, in the night, if you look towards the south and take that angle, you know, going from Scorpio down to Lupus and to Centaurus, you'll see this object. And it's very, very interesting because you can quickly tell it is not a star, but you know, it's kind of nicely visible. That's what it looks like uh, with a good telescope. And it's a much bigger cluster than Hercules and several other, other clusters. And what is stunning about it is that the European Space Agency got to task uh, zooming into a small portion, a small portion in the outskirts like that. And what you see are stars, incredible numbers of stars. And uh, so you're going like, this is the universe. As Pio said, where real things are happening. I don't think we are uh, even part of this uh, incredible uh, Christmas decoration that goes on uh, in the stars uh, night and day, every day. We have put out a lot of telescopes um, you know, first, we put out, um, let me see, we put out ground-based telescopes and they're getting bigger every day, every day. Um, we went down to Mount Palomar, which is up on the hills over here. And you looked at the hooker scope that, um, that uh, Edwin Hubble looked at to study galaxies. Soon after, we started sending out telescopes into space. And just a few weeks ago, we started again and there's one resting at, uh, at um, Kourou, ready to take off next week. And so uh, these are incredible instruments that look out and tell you what it is that is happening out there. Many, many scopes, ground scopes and uh, space scopes. So we are learning a lot. And um, these are some of the things that they are capable of doing. And as you can see, they are going higher and higher into the mountains. And um, uh, Chile now um, has some of the finest uh, uh, observational equipment. And then uh, two years ago, a group um, out of MIT said, hey, we got to have a very large aperture uh, to do what they call synthetic aperture viewing. So they put up scopes, they looked at uh, uh, a particular uh, um, black hole uh, uh, and uh, uh, they zoomed through 
uh, different scopes placed in uh, different parts of this giant earth disk like this. And uh, there was that, that's a part in Chile. And uh, uh, we got, what are we seeing? That's uh, Giotto, no, that is uh, Green Bank, I think. And there were six observatories that sat together and looked at this part of the sky directly for the longest time and um, then time integrated uh, all the data. To give, you enough, to, idea, to give you an idea of how much data was gathered, it was quicker to fly the data in their large hard drives to MIT than to transmit them over, uh, over fiber because it was pera, pera, um, uh, byte data. And this is the image they got. April of uh, 2019, they got this image and they do what they call the channelizing and the coordination of all the data. And you get this beautiful image of what we think is the, uh, is the black hole. And uh, you have um, some uh, lighting here um, because of the Einstein uh, effect. Now, there are more lined up to go. This one just went up two weeks ago. Uh, it will also look at black holes. Uh, this is uh, JWST. Uh, they are ready to go in the next uh, few days. So um, I'm glad that many of you brought up uh, astronomy and uh, looking at the skies uh, to know our place in the universe. Uh, so what are some of these philosophies, space philosophies that uh, people are, um, are promoting now? Uh, Elon Musk is pretty clear. He says that human survival is key. Uh, anything can happen on planet Earth. So we need to promote, uh, you know, uh, move out and uh, occupy the rest of the planet. Jeff Bezos says, you know, we have one unique, mightily beautiful planet. We cannot mess it, mess it anymore. We have to take all our industries outside. And I think uh, Adriano too talks about this. Um, and uh, in some ways, um, it's an uh, interesting thought. Keep Earth beautiful and precious. Our dean at USC uh, went on to be uh, the science advisor for um, George Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush, the, the senior. Um, and uh, he said that um, the idea behind space activity is to, uh, is to get resources from space and bring it to earth and improve our economies. Joseph Campbell, uh, who was uh, the mentor for George Lucas and all of those Star Wars had a philosophy saying that humanity, uh, the idea behind space is to go back and come back and be and tell stories so that you expand your mind beyond planet earth. Freeman Dyson, our good friend who is no longer with us, said he has been looking with the scopes out into, into space for the longest time. He doesn't see anything. It is cold, it is dark, and it doesn't speak to us. It just stays there. There is some dynamism in stars and so on, but in general, if you look out, it's not talking to us. So maybe our job is to get out there and beautify our universe. And Frank White, we all know, uh, Mike and I sat in his first lecture at uh, MIT during those times. And uh, he says that once you go out, your mind changes forever. And in, in fact, it does. You know, anybody uh, getting on a plane flight and looking down at our cities, um, we get a different feeling about, about how people live and move around and do things. So Frank White says, if you go into orbit, and you come back, you, you're a changed person because you don't see the politics that Mike talked about. Uh, you don't see um, uh, the uh, geographic divisions and uh, the planet Earth appears to be alive and dynamic. And for all the terrible things we do to her, <laughs> uh, she seems to tolerate us. And most recently, Michelle Hanlon, I think she was here at the AIAA talks 
and may appear again. Uh, she is currently the uh, president of the National Space Society. And uh, she's a lawyer by profession. And she says that we must preserve our cultural heritage as does Alice mentions here, I think. And they're all in that group uh, thinking about cultural species, cultural heritage preservation outside of planet Earth that Alice wonderfully took us through. And these are some of the ideas that are going on. <laughs> and just the other day, uh, Captain Kirk, um, and, uh, William Shatner, he went up and uh, I was happy to see uh, a slide from one of you um, that showed um, uh, Bill next to you. Who was that? Uh, uh, Kaya, was that you who showed that slide? Oh no, it was Anita. <laughs> Anita goes places. Anyhow, um, uh, Captain Kirk comes down and says something that I had never heard, heard before. He said, when you look down on Earth on this incredibly fast flight, in just a few minutes, uh, you look down and see, this is where all the living things and everything are, you know, as Carl Sagan says. And then he looks up towards, uh, towards the sky and it's pitch black. And, uh, you know, there is nothing living there. And it stunned him that, that this is what space activity is about, going out, uh, expanding your soul and coming back. It's very important, coming back and saying, oh boy, you don't know how precious this place is. Um, um, uh, Nicole showed us the thin skin of planet Earth. Uh, you know, so this in itself is a philosophy knowing that our planet is precious and we have to take care of it. And uh, some of you address climate change, it's very, very important. And um, you know, John mentioned it too. I don't know how long the planet will take a beating from us uh, before she decides, no, no, next time, no brains. <laughs> and uh, um, so, I, you know, and um, I think um, several scientists mentioned this. Um, here you see uh, James Love, um, Lovelock, uh, the proponent of the uh, Gaia hypothesis. He says that the way you tackle mother nature's uh, wrath, now that you're messed up, is to become adaptable, not go and do something crazy and dumb, but to adapt to it. And I think, I think human space flight has some of the ingredients uh, for us to make those changes without messing up uh, our environment anymore. And uh, so I think that is something to think about, adaptation using space technologies. So what does my philosophy? <laughs> I think we have to save ourselves. Planet Earth has gone through this many, many times. She knows how to manage. And if somebody misbehaves, she'll just take us out. And that's what Elizabeth Colbert talks about in the sixth extinction. A lot, of, um, a lot of the biosphere is under threat. And that is why the current administration, Biden administration is looking to space for uh, activities in climate change. So uh, we want to live with minimal ecological footprint and human space flight may hold, I'm not saying it does, may hold some of the keys. And I also have this pet peeve I tell others now, I think the reason we don't see aliens is because they are silent. They know the power of the universe. And we will know too in a few hundred years if we haven't already that you're dealing with the universe as uh, um, uh, Pio said, you know, the universe is looking at the, uh, itself. I don't think the universe is paying attention to us at all uh, because uh, <laughs> there's so much more going on um, for us little astronomers who look up at the skies, uh, it makes us humble. Um, uh, you know, now we are um, uh, getting out into space, not as governments, but as citizens from people all over the world. And it's happening at a very fast pace. So I think um, as um, just to make uh, Mike happy, I think um, we need uh, 
a change in national space policy priorities. We have to make crew safety and crew support architecture uh, the first important because lots of people are going to go out. And right now, if you read the NASA reports, it's all about going out and being brave, you know, daredevils. It's not the way it works in the 21st century. If you don't establish <laughs> crew safety and emergency procedures before you engage, and we learned it the hard way. And on shuttle, after three problems, we finally said, no, we'll have a shuttle on the launch pad in case things go wrong. We learned that, but, but we still don't think about it till things happen, till things go bad. So in terms of policy, current policy, I would recommend we do very quickly, things do quickly. And for that, you don't have to go develop new technologies. If you're going to the moon, we went there 50 years ago and some, we can do it now. And this is what our class project was about this fall. You'll all get to see the slides later. And if, you re if NASA really wanted to go to the moon, the first thing they would set up is an Artemis office. Guess what? They did that two years ago. They were rejected. They got kicked out. They said, no, 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 we don't want to do that. So, so again, your question, you're asking, is this for real? And so at USC in this uh, fall program, we said one thing we can do very clearly. If you take out ISS operations and management out of NASA, NASA will have a lot of money to do uh, Artemis to go back to the moon. And we can still hold the 2024 goal. Use all the existing materials. Don't go doing new technologies. You can use Apollo hardware. And I think we should do it that way if you want to do 2024. We had some very great slides. You'll get to see them. Um, when the archives come out uh, uh, in the coming, coming uh, in the new year. There are many technologies all of you touched on, and they are important to know. Um, space always is at the leading edge of many of these technologies. And uh, Edward Teller tells us something, uh, one of the fathers of, uh, of the atomic age, he said that technology is a running machine. The moment you stop and rest, somebody else will take over and run with it. It is true with all of science too. If you think you've reached the ultimate, your neighbor is going to do better than you. Just give them, just give them a little time. So um, um, vital technologies with critical implications for space operations in general, and human spaceflight in particular, are racing along uh, in, in now. They include fully reusable rockets. Elon is waiting to start the Starship going. It's going to see a lot of explosions, but we'll have to do that. Um, communications is already improved. Mega orders of magnitude. And uh, this is happening right as we speak. Laser communications has taken over. We are able to link the earth and moon with lasers and we're going to use that. And this area of AI, if you look at the history of it, it all starts with automation in the industrial age. Robotics, autonomy aided by robotics. We, you're right, we may, see, we may see robots working and doing things in space, aided by ultra uh, broadband and machine learning and artificial intelligence. Nuclear power has taken a very important turn for propulsion and power. And last of all, I should say, you will never know what molecular biology and genetic engineering can do to make us superhumans. And I think things will happen very, very quickly. Wait a minute, and that was for my class. Anyhow, my lecture is done. I still wanna go watch Omega Centauri uh, on a good uh, summer night. I hope you all do too. It, it, it gives you some amount of humility. Can you imagine? Some of these planets have, have uh, you know, biology uh, far superior to us. I mean, these were things the old Greeks told us. And uh, no, we are a very, very conceited uh, species. 
we are ego people, uh, but uh, over time, I think we will appreciate these things more. And I hope that time is now. With that, I want to thank you all. Stay safe. Merry Christmas wishes and enjoy the holidays. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. <laughs> thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Enjoy your evening. Agastra. <laughs>